Good morning, everybody. We are ready to start the second day of the school. And it's a pleasure for me to leave the stage to Professor Rita Casadio from the University of Bologna. No. Hello to everybody. I am uh, Rita Casadio from the Biocomputing Group of the University of Bologna. And possibly I'm here because we started a master in bioinformatics, the first in Italy in English in the year 2007. And uh, from uh, this experience, I think that uh, it's a pleasure to accept to give lecture in bioinformatics around. Well, having said this, I noticed that the title of the school is <laughs> Bioinformatics Meets simulation. Fantastic. But uh, in principle, uh, what I will do today uh, is to give you a general, uh, uh, general overview of uh, my understanding of what, can, of, of what bioinformatics can do. And uh, I will pinpoint some of the most urgent problems that are uh, you know, nowadays debated and that eventually simulation can solve step by step. Okay? Good. So the title that is a little bit robust is Transfer of Knowledge for Structural and Functional Annotation of Protein Sequences. And now we have step by step to understand <laughs> the reason of this title. I don't know how many of you are experts in bioinformatics, and therefore I really don't care. I'm, I will, you will excuse me if I'm you know, saying things that are perhaps uh, uh, over-debated, and you know. But in principle, I hope at the end of this one hour and a half effort, uh, on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, you will get something out of it. So. Um, that's it. And then a little bit of the overview of my talk. Perhaps I will not touch all these items. Perhaps I will skip some of the slides. We will see, because I tend to uh, over <laughs> comment on my slides. And therefore, I don't know. I don't want to finish up at, uh, in, in one hour and a half. I want to stop after a while and let you ask questions, possibly. So I will start with my view of life complexity. And then I will tell you about uh, the problem of big data in molecular biology. And then I will perhaps uh, set uh, or insist uh, on new norms that are necessary in, uh, in this field uh, that is called uh, the big data era even in molecular biology, data quality first of all, information content and standards that are generally um, debated under the field of interoperability. And then, <laughs> quite obvious, since we are a group that historically developed machine learning approaches for sequence analysis, I will pinpoint uh, a few uh, remarks on machine learning, no formula, <laughs> <laughs> because I don't, I don't think that I will have the time to enter into many details. And then the final message. We need to be picky. Why? Because in principle, we know little, and from the little we know, we pretend to transfer knowledge to a universe of items that are called protein, protein sequences, their function, their interaction, et cetera, et cetera. And then, okay, obviously, I will do also some selling of what we have been <laughs> doing through the years, but I don't know if I will reach number six. Problem is that in the afternoon, we will have some sort of uh, practicum that will be run by my colleagues, Professor Bertelli, also in the biocomputing group, uh, and that's it. Okay, so feel free to interrupt me if you need some explanation feel free to interact as much as possible because the effort is for you, not for me, etc. Okay, 
So the chiefer in life complexity. What is life complexity? But I think that everybody thinks to know, or uh, at least is aware of what is life co complexity at the cell level. Hmm? And so uh, if we think of the interplay between cells and their environment, or even tissues and their environment, it's quite obvious that we think in terms, and ecco subito qui, ecco qua. Uh -huh. Can you see the pointer? Yes? I hope so. Hello? Can you see the pointer? Good. <laughs> it's an easy question. So we start thinking in terms of genome and transcriptome. So whatever is in the DNA that through RNA is transferred at the level of the protein that can be differently expressed. Ma questo coso mi funziona poco bene. Huh? Okay. At the level of the proteome, ho qualche problema con il pointer. Eh? At the level of the proteome, as I said, so you start with DNA, and then you have proteins that are transcribed, and then there is a lot of, uh, you know, emphasis on what we call protein-protein interaction, protein-DNA interaction these days. Why? Because molecular interactions uh, are, you know, at the basis of what we think are the emerging properties of the cell. So complexity for us these days is basically due to macromolecular crowding. And uh, we know some we, we have some models for these mole macromolecular crowdings, but still the models are preliminary and not uh, at all, uh, and not you know, capable of giving us all the explanations of how cells are working. So these ohms, uh, please remember, because these, these days we are thinking in terms of genomes, transcriptomes, that means how uh, genes are transcribed, and which is the level of concentration of the different genes in the cell. Proteomes, I would like to remark here that each cell, each cell type has its own proteome, even in the human being, so tissues have different proteomes depending on the needs of uh, uh, the different cells and uh, their uh, physiological role. And then there is the problem of molecular interactions in terms of interactome, revulomes, metabolomes, so all the different chemicals that are around in the cell and that are somehow regulated by the presence of the proteome and the protein-protein interaction or protein-DNA interaction that is regulating the level of transcription. Clear enough for everybody, and this is, should be, a, you know, what I call the ingredients of the biological complexity at the cell level, from gene to proteins, their interaction, and the interplay with the environment. Please remember that this is another scenario that is often neglected when uh, modeling is ongoing. Good. Uh, in 2002, uh, Barabasi, Albert Lazar Barabasi, who is running a lab um, very uh, important lab uh, in uh, New York City, uh, they put up this nice scheme that is useful for everybody to understand life complexity. Why? I'm coming immediately to the point in which, you know, uh, practically the idea is that in a cell you have an information storage, and this is obviously the level of uh, the chromatin in, this, in that cell, then the, you have a processing of whatever is the information content, uh, and then you have the execution. And this is very general and allows you uh, to transcribe all this um, you know, flow of information, even in terms of uh, um, information, so models based on information theory. Very good. Then there are the basic molecules around, and these are billions of different types of molecules. And we 
pretty much through structural biochemistry, structural bioinformatics, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we have uh, a deep knowledge of all these molecules isolated from the context. Mm? So we, we know, for example, and uh, we will see um, proteins uh, even in terms of their electron densities. And we know the interaction between metabolites and different proteins. We know the interaction between proteins and DNA. We have some information on the organization, on the three-dimensional organization of DNA, but we know very little about how uh, DNA is organized in chromosome and particularly on chromosome-chromosome interaction. So what I call the chromatin structure in the cell that is obviously a dynamic entity. And then what we do pretend to do is uh, through experimental studies in biochemistry, for example, or in molecular biology, is the idea of uh, identifying what we call the molecular or metabolic pathways. So interactions uh, that is not necessarily physics interaction, but can be physical interaction between different molecules in order to give rise to what we call a metabolic process. So a process that starts with substrate and ends up with products at the level of the cell so that different metabolic pathways are then supporting the notion of the life of the cell, etc. And then, as probably you uh, debated yesterday, we have the possibility of, uh, uh, you know, through interaction of different molecules, uh, um, generate, we have the possibility to generate, this, what we call the functional modules, so proteins that are closely interact, interacting in order to give rise to specific metabolic pathways or biological processes, as we call them in a more, I would say, general uh, version of uh, these, uh, of the metabolism. So metabolism at a certain point is a subset of reaction of a more general um, understanding of uh, all the different mechanisms in the cell that are, that is a biological process. And then there are large scale organization. And then you may play around with all these networks and try to apply network theory to for an understanding of this um, organization. Problem is that when you do experiments, specifically in interactomics, uh, you don't find a reproducibility of the data. And recently, for example, in the case of the human interactome, there are two famous papers in Nature and Science, two different human interactomes done in different ways from different labs uh, claiming the same number of interaction but totally different. So uh, we have problems because from the theoretical point of view, everything you know, is uh, demanded to mathematics and mathematics is powerful in interpreting at a certain point uh, uh, you know, all the possible interaction. But the problem are the underlying experimental data. So, Nowadays, we are aware of the problem of, you know, uh, generating very high quality data. Because if data are not reproducible, something, you know, can be really debated in terms of our modeling afterwards. I'm not an experimentalist, so I feel that if I have to work on data that are not high quality, I rather stop working, okay? Good, as I said, and the, this is very, uh, well, if you followed my, ooh, if you followed my introduction, problem is that we know a lot about uh, molecules, really a lot these days, genes, messenger RNAs, proteins, messenger RNAs is, uh, the, the, the extent of messenger RNAs is called the transcriptome and then proteins, metabolites, et cetera, et cetera. We know a little bit less on regulatory motifs and metabolic pathways. Mm -hmm. In terms of experimental validation of our models, particularly, we know little on these functional models. And um, 
not so much on this large scale organization. Okay, it's clear to everybody. You have uh, in, in the slides, you have also the uh, references, the quotation, and so you may want, if you want to read, you may ask us in the afternoon because we have copies of this paper, but you may find them quite easily. Uh, not only the situation is this complicated, because, okay, crowding, you did understand what is what it is. So molecular crowding, <laughs> there is this nice paper uh, that was out in uh, 2010, in which uh, uh, the, the authors, they, they, they played around with simulation of all the different uh, interaction in E. coli. And, uh, um, so knowing the structure of the protein, they were trying to um, simulate uh, the cytoplasm of the cell and the interaction of the protein inside the cytoplasm. But the situation is even more complicated since uh, recently uh, there is a nice concept that came uh, along in literature and was debated in different papers. I just took this picture from the paper of... Uh, uh, this author in science in 2017. And the idea di is that not only macromolecular crowding is there. Uh, in eukaryotic cells, we have thousands of compartments uh, that are membrane bound, so to say, the mitochondrion, the chloroplast in uh, vegetal, uh, in green cells, etc. Hmm? just to name some of them. But we have the problem of, uh, uh, I would say, protein phase separation. Uh, what is it? It's a phenomenon that is uh, experimentally documented in which dynamically you have the formation of aggregates inside the cytoplasm of a cell that is transient. And so apparently what it's called the liquid phase condensation in cell physiology is a transient phenomenon that is there, particularly under certain circumstances. They have been observed since a while, but they were associated particularly to an abnormal situation in a cell. Nowadays, it became evident, according to this literature, that in principle, it's quite, you know, uh, common to find these aggregates that are time dependent also in normal cells. So the idea of, uh, you know, crowding is even more complicated by the fact that crowding can be local and uh, linked to, the uh, to, to certain physiological needs of the cell and then is transient. So simulation becomes really difficult at this point since you have to take into consideration also this new phase that is due to the presence of non-membrane-bound organelles inside a cell. Okay? Complexity, we went through what complexity is nowadays. It's quite obvious to think that, okay, what do we want to do? in bioinformatics, particularly, but also in simulation afterwards. Uh, we, would be, uh, we would like to be able to, to find the control panel of all <laughs> the function of a cell, which is very difficult if you think of it. And if you think of it in terms of all the difficulties at the level of uh, determining exactly all the uh, characteristics of the different complexities that I was mentioning. Good. So what are we doing in reality? So this is more or less the general overview. Good. What are we doing in reality? In reality, well, we know how to sequence. Uh, I think that sequencing by now is a sort of uh, universal uh, experiment that is carried out in, uh, I don't know, many lab, thanks to the fact that in principle, we were able to, we, in the sense of the scientific community, we were able to end up with uh, so many different types of uh, sequencing machine. Um, I would refer to it as next generation sequencing stuff. 
so in the market. And this means uh, production of uh, enormous volumes of data, telling us what? Well, uh, you may use uh, sequencing for different purposes. Again, I will not enter into too many details, but in the afternoon or afterwards, we can, we can have a discussion. But in principle, you may address genomic, transcriptomic, exomic, protein DNA interaction, interactomic, methylomics, etc., etc., through sequencing and with different, uh, uh, obviously, uh, recipes for the preparation of the material and uh, with different approaches for data analysis, you may end up having information at the level of the different uh, omics that I described. Hmm? Nowadays, we also focus very much on what is called the single cell sequencing. Why? Because we realize that in principle, when you are doing sequencing, you are dealing with the cell population, and particularly when you are addressing the problem of cancer, we know very well that cells may have a different uh, uh, you know, uh, organization and a different uh, content in terms, so they, may, they are different. So there is no homogeneity in a biopsy. So problem of single cell sequencing is open and is there for, uh, you know, uh, for, being, uh, for giving us even more data and more questions to answer. Very good. Mm, I would say that starting 2010, if you want to have some landmark, we, we think in terms of big data, why? Uh, there was this, there was this um, cover story in The Economist in which, um, this Kenneth Hookier introduced the data deluge as a possible you know, overflow of data in different fields, economy, social science, etc. Good, and uh, since then, we practically, uh, I, 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 I'm writing and commenting, biological data grow big. So even in molecular biology, we started with the enormous application of next generation sequencing to enter the phase of big data even in molecular biology. Okay, so, so far so good. Oops, oops, oops. Mm. <laughs> okay, so here, you have this reference in which you can easily see what's going on, although the, 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 the graphic stops at the year 2012. You have the problem of, uh, you know, a steady state, very, you know, normal increase of uh, um, volume of data in molecular biology that abruptly starts increasing very exponentially, I would say, although this is a log scale, so you see a slope, but a straight line, but uh, um, the idea is that, uh, you know, even more to it, uh, nowadays we are growing as fast as the volume of data in nuclear physics, for example. Okay, so the problem here is storage, obviously, uh, and uh, data analysis as a consequence. So what is bioinformatics? <laughs> Bioinformatics is a very broad uh, term that includes handling of databases, and uh, here we are, handling of databases, that means implementation, data mining, interoperability, etc. So databases have to talk to each other. Interoperability means that I can establish a link in order to retrieve information for the same item from different databases, okay? And then you have computational biology. Computational biology, like me. <laughs> I, when somebody is asking me what I am, I'm saying I'm a physicist and eventually a computational biologist. But problem is that from databases, what in order to retrieve information and knowledge, after all, you want to uh, develop tools 
and we will enter a little bit in this uh, particular subject. In order to perform what? Sequence analysis, uh, in order to address the problem of functional genomics, and then proteomics, etc. And we will see something about this. And then, after this preliminary uh, filtering of the data, in order to reduce the dimension, to extract information, to derive knowledge, you enter the field of systems biology, in which eventually you generate models uh, that uh, can tell you about the physiology of the system at a different level of complexity. So uh, nowadays, what we need is practically what? A fast and efficient transfer of information from data to models. OK? Mm, do you see the screen? Because <laughs> so I don't know where to put myself. <laughs> then I don't know how to operate. <laughs> and this is another story. But I don't see the, the red light, so I, I don't like it. And uh, perhaps I should go there and use the mouse. But OK, let's do. So if you, if you don't follow, if you, if you want to ask questions, please do it. Huh? So why machine learning in this scenario? This is the main question. I don't know how familiar are you with machine learning, because everybody now, nowadays think, thinks in terms of machine learning. But the idea is, what is machine learning, first of all? So if you are asking me what is machine learning, my definition of machine learning is a general nonlinear functional mapping. What does it mean? It means that you have practically set of variables around, and you, you, are not fam you are not sure or you don't find an analytical solution in order to link the different variables, to establish links between the different variables. And so you are trying to use these methods in order to possibly do a fitting operation in a space that is rather uh, you see, uh, well, the solution is rather complicated because it does, it has different minima. And so the, the solution is a, a, a non-standard solution in order to link sets of variables, okay? Uh, there are thousands of different approaches that you may uh, collect under the label of machine learning. Neural networks, uh, hidden neural networks, uh, support vector machine, uh, hidden Markov models, uh, conditional random fields, convolution neural networks. Uh, and the, 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 the last three are what we call nowadays deep learning. And we will give you a little bit of uh, you know, definition of this, this, this deep learning that is really um, you know, easy in a way. So convolutional neural network, uh, recurrent neural network, uh, last short-term memories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK? Why these methods are important nowadays? Ah, because of the big data. The big data and, uh, you know, you need to have methods uh, that in principle, when you don't know the solution to your problem, are capable of extracting at least a uh, you know, connection between the different variables, as we said. Uh, I don't know if you want to go through this. This is a very typical beginning of uh, a, very, a very simple idea of what an artificial neural network is. Uh, is a layer of, uh, let me go. Is a layer of computing unit here. So you start with uh, vectors. So you have to encode the information. And these are the so-called input vectors. And then you have a layer of outputs. And uh, in this case, this is a feed-forward neural network. The information flow goes from the input towards the output. And you establish connection between these two layers. This is a very simple perceptron, as it was devised in 1946, I think. But the idea is that as long as you don't have uh, an algorithm for training this connection, so 
So for defining the value of uh, the weights between the input and the outputs, it was useless. And uh, we practically, we started in 1986 uh, with this PhD student who was able to, to design what is called the gradient descent or the backpropagation training algorithm. So you have an error function in this case. The error function, you know the real output. And what you want to do is to adjust all this connection in order to derive from the input uh, something is as much as close as possible to the real output. So more or less, this concept you know, has been debated extensively in terms of whatever feature has a network in, in order to become efficient as an extraction of information, extractor of information, etc. So, uh, so far so good, because then, depending on the architecture, so the number of layers, uh, the number of connections, uh, the way in which you connect the different weights among them, the, the, the different nodes among them, and uh, the way in which uh, you practically uh, design the architecture of the network, what you do is generally you have a known mapping, that means a known correspondence between the input and the output, and then you want uh, that you want that the method, the network, learns the correspondence between the input and the output. A trivial example, you want to predict the secondary structure of proteins starting from sequence, you have the sequence, the real secondary structure as derived from the structure of the protein, and then you want to establish the connection that you know is not by univocal at all, okay? So the idea here is fantastic. We have a training phase, so we have to adjust the values of the connections during the training phase. When the training phase stops for some reason, that can be a, a little difference between the desired output and the required uh, and the actual output. And uh, um, of, for example, a certain number of cycles, etc., you fix the weights. And so whatever is a predictor based on neural network is a device in which you are not allowed to change the weights anymore, but you are using the predictor in, 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 in the sense that you are transferring whatever is stored in the predictor and you are transferring it uh, in a new sequence, for example, or whatever items is submitted to the networks in order to understand uh, whether certain feature are probable or not for a given item, okay? So far, so good, in the sense that I hope to have, uh, you know, addressed the core issue in terms of uh, what is uh, a machine learning based method. Obviously, this is just a very rough, very rough comment. So while we were producing big data, uh, we also uh, developed what? Machine learning and deep learning method. Nowadays, everything is under the domain of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is there since a while. And uh, at a certain point, uh, we were also embarrassed because we didn't know exactly what was artificial intelligence, but nowadays, uh, in principle, even artificial intelligence is taking advantages from machine learning and deep learning. Which is the difference between the two? Or if you are not familiar with, you may simply think, think in terms of this nice cartoon in which uh, in, uh, with neural network and machine learning, uh, well, different type of neural network and architecture, as we said, you do a classification that up to a certain point depends very much also on the future extraction that you present to the network. So you are always responsible of the input that you give in order to later on classify the items. In deep learning, in principle, it's even easier because you submit, you prepare the input, but you don't uh, force any feature extraction. 
the uh, well, the deep learning procedure is practically doing whatever. Okay, now two type of problems here. Uh, which problem? First of all, data quality, because <laughs> in any case, if you don't have data that are good enough, whatever, the system will give you something, but uh, pay attention to, 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 the, to the outcome, huh? because in terms of particularly uh, biology, it's difficult if you don't, if you are not able to justify biologically your results. <laughs> then uh, you have another problem that is uh, obviously which type of knowledge you are extracting and what you want to do with uh, this uh, extraction. Uh, so machine learning and deep learning can be uh, useful in many instances with many different problems of uh, data analysis in molecular biology, but you should consider also some, uh, uh, some uh, you should consider also uh, some caution in applying blindly machine learning or deep learning, so I will call it machine learning, uh, including deep learning whatsoever. So to conclude with this slide, what I would, I would like to uh, underline is the following. Through the years, practically, there was a flourishing of machine learning approaches starting in the 80s, and we belong practically to, 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 to the community of people using machine learning for data analysis in the field of molecular biology. And then since, uh, I would say, um, another decade, deep learning is becoming important to solve certain problems, even in molecular biology. And uh, by now, we have uh, a new practically field that is called data science, even in biology. And uh, there are PhD programs around in data science in which these methods are uh, uh, applied to different uh, uh, fields. And uh, there is a program even in Bologna in uh, data science. So practically, if you are focusing in data science, the idea is uh, that you should become an expert, not only in machine learning, but also in the field in which you want to apply machine learning, okay? Good. So here we are, caution. Caution why? We need data quality. We need uh, to think of the information content of the data and which data should be used with machine learning to extract information because not all the data are suited to machine learning. And then standards. Good. So first of all, uh, I should say that I collected this information, you know, just uh, to give you the idea that nowadays there is another field that is called developing algorithms for checking data quality. I will not enter again into these details, but the idea is that when you think in terms of data quality, and I gave you an example in relation to protein-protein interaction, because I said, look, when you <laughs> look at papers like Nature and Science and you compare to human proteomes these days, uh, then starting from the same proteins, the idea is uh, that the interaction among the two different proteomes are different when measured with different approaches in different labs. So <laughs> this is the problem. Data quality means also data reproducibility because otherwise we don't know exactly what we are you know, evaluating afterwards. So there are around uh, these stories, debates on the seven dimensions to measure data quality. That means completeness, conformity, consistency, accuracy, unique, unique, uniqueness, integrity, and process quality. 
but you know, more or less we are there. To which extent are data reproducible? To which extent in different labs data can be reproduced? This is a problem in this omics that we have around. Not to say <laughs> the difference between a genome sequenced in the usual way versus a single cell sequencing approach. So it may be a little bit, you know, a surprise for you, but in principle, uh, even the genomes perhaps will change when the single sequencing approach uh, will reach a level of, uh, you know, reproducibility around in the world. So even the genomes in the database may change a little bit their composition. We don't know, okay? So everything is open. This means good for you because you are young and so you may find a possibility to enter any field these days because, you know, there are so many opportunities and nothing is really, uh, you know, accomplished to the end. Very good. Then the information. Hmm. This is a little bit of a problem because, you know, I'm always sort of uh, debating this uh, and asking if there is more <laughs> information in sequence or in a structure. The, the, the answer is quite obvious in my case. And the idea is if you have, if you start with the gene that is generally represented with the four letter code, as you know, and then you go to a protein in which you have a 20 letter code, but you are at the level of the sequence, fantastic. You may know all the different properties, chemical physical properties of the different, you know, residues that are here represented, A, C, T, G, when you are dealing with a, a, a gene, or the different 20 letters when you are dealing with the, the residues or amino acid residues in the protein backbone. But the idea is that as, as long as you don't have the uh, structure, so the electron, as long as you don't know the electron density of the molecule, you know very little. First of all, you cannot do simulation, in my opinion. Second of all, uh, here you may play around with ligands, uh, interactors, uh, effectors, <coughs> molecules, binding of molecules, etc., etc. So. It's quite obvious that the level of information increases depending on how much or what you know in relation to a specific item. Um, you may go on with this story, even in the case of protein-protein interaction or protein-DNA interaction is not in the cartoon, but the idea is if you know how proteins interact, you may derive a lot of information in relation to the interaction at the level of the surface of the proteins. And you may derive information also for going on with your process of transfer of knowledge. Okay? So, which are the standards for the application of machine learning in biology? Remember, data quality is an issue always. But the idea is machine learning. When should I apply machine learning? First of all, quality and informative data. But there is another problem, structured data. Because if you want to go on with machine learning, you need to uh, know in advance that eventually your data uh, have a graphical relation between the variables in a way. So you suspect that there are relationship among the different set of variables. Why? Because if you have unstructured data, you may as well use any other type of statistical method. Perhaps you get even better results instead of using machine learning, okay? Then it's critical the reproducibility of the performance. And then, as I said, you need training and testing sets. So you need to have uh, a rigorous selection between what is the training, so the, uh, the set of uh, uh, items from which you extract the weight values in a way. Huh? And then you have also two tests uh, independently your system. 
So the idea is that if you uh, have leakage among training and testing sets, so to say that there is overlapping, uh, you are cheating. So at the end, you, you are generating systems that are well performing because <laughs> they knew already what they have to compute. Uh, <laughs> and so there is no way around because, uh, for example, you cannot claim later on uh, that the, the method, the system is uh, generalizing enough uh, to be good uh, to infer from whatever you want to uh, present to the system, uh, uh, you would like to infer. So the idea is that perhaps uh, the, few, the, the transfer of features is fake. Huh? And then that you need also a rigorous cross-validation procedure. So the idea of uh, training and testing in a different way. So you have to test what you didn't choose. You have to test the system on what you didn't choose for the training. So these are the major requirements. And this, this item is really debated around in literature. And for example, even in this uh, recently uh, Jones, David Jones Nature Review Molecular Cell Comment. Huh? So uh, I would like you to be aware of all these items before going on and before reaching the point in which uh, uh, you, you, you should ask yourself why this is so important. Ah, because it's very easy, you know, later on saying, how can we describe the human complexity from genotypes to phenotypes? Fantastic. But remember that each icon here represents what? A specific field of investigation, even in molecular biology. Why? Because you start with... Uh, genes in DNA, so genomics, and then uh, you go to proteins, so sequencing and uh, X-ray crystallography, NMR methods, uh, cryo-electron microscopy, etc. and then functions, microarrays, and then protein-protein uh, interactions, so the idea of metabolic pathways, etc. and then you have the problem for humans of the differences in uh, the genes that are reflected in differences in the extraction of the proteins. And so you have what is called, generally speaking, uh, the effect of variability. So mutations start in genes and then later on are transferred to protein and variations. And eventually, uh, this will hamper all the different biological processes and metabolic pathways and we and it can be also linked to disease, human diseases. Mm -hmm. So pay attention because when you are saying, okay, fantastic, I will, uh, I will model, I will model how to go from the genotype to the phenotype. Nowadays, what we are doing, we establish link afterwards among different domains of investigation, different data analysis that, in a way, give us knowledge that we do pretend later on to collect and to end up and say, OK, fantastic, we have uh, some interpretation of the phenotype at the level of what is happening, molecularly speaking. Huh? So uh, I would like you to think in these terms. Good. And I'll go on without any break, without any question. I'm a human being. Eh? <laughs> I'm not a machine. <laughs> OK? And now we are at the point that I wanted to, you know, after this long introduction that in my opinion was necessary for you to enter into the merit. The problem is now genomical functional annotation. So what do I want to do here? I want to say, okay, I start from a protein sequence and I want to know the function of the protein. It's very difficult. <laughs> it's a very difficult problem if you think of it. Uh, 
fantastic. And this is transfer of knowledge as it, it is done in many of the databases that are around. Why? Because sequences are, uh, you know, as soon as you know a gene, you may traduce the gene, translate the gene into a protein, and eventually the protein is there, although you don't have any, any uh, experiment at all proving the real existence of the protein or not then one should also think in terms of what is a gene these days, but I will not you know, enter in all the different problems that we have around. So what is functional genomics, generally speaking? Okay, fantastic. This functional genomics, uh, as I said, we, have, we know uh, protein structure. Uh, we may derive uh, sequence, protein sequence alignment by superimposing protein structure. So we may define what is a protein family in that fantastic way. The only proof that an alignment method is correct is because you derive the sequence alignment from the superimposition of the protein structure. Because otherwise, you know, it's simply a very nice algorithm that is working, but is, you don't have any biological evidence of the correctness of the alignment. Very good. So you have proteins, from proteins you may derive knowledge, from protein structure you may derive uh, knowledge, as we said, and then you may think of, uh, you know, defining uh, uh, how the metabolism is working, and uh, you may have models, metabolomic models, and then whatever can be, you know, in a circle, sent back uh, to the regulation of the uh, gene expression, because this is the way in which we think the, the cell is working. And also you have the problem of the interaction with the environment. So what is functional genomics is to extract knowledge from what we know and try to use it to annotate, we say, so to endow with feature other molecules that are generally also around, but for, for which we don't know the structure, practically. Hmm? And then there is the problem of validation, because you may be a perfect um, implementator of algorithms that are wonderful, but then this algorithm may fail. Why? Because if you don't, if you cannot prove that you are saying something in a specific field in which you apply your algorithm, uh, you are not taken into consideration. So the problem of data production and data analysis, which reflect what? That from genes and uh, gene recognition, we reach the level of protein translation, is obviously a big problem. Why? Because the experiment to validate protein structure and function produce data in a time that is much, much uh, larger, so much longer, than that required to deposit putative protein sequences into a database. So we have an enormous number of sequences, but we know very little about these sequences. Why? Because we don't have time, really, to experimentally prove and validate that these sequences exist as proteins and uh, have they have specific functions, okay? So here we are. What is annotation, protein sequence annotation, is the operation of endowing with structure and functional feature protein sequences after gene translation, and which is the real problem. We know nowadays, perhaps, some <laughs> 100,000 genomes, because the number is increasing and increasing and increasing, we have 170 million of protein sequences in the databases. How many structures do we have? At least three order of magnitude less than the number of sequences. So in the PDB nowadays, you have some 160,000 files, and you know that redundancy, you don't want to have redundancy around, so we know very little in principle, okay? Redundancy of leakage or leakage between different data, because if the data are always the same, 
uh, obviously you cannot derive information unless you have variability even in the data. Okay, good. So we have big problems in the big omic era after genome sequences. Our knowledge is mainly stored in biological databases. So PDB contains protein structure and nowadays even electron densities that is good because the protein structure are, you know, uh, sort of the way in which I represented this big protein that is there in a polymerase elongation complex. So there is even DNA in there and RNA, okay? Uh, is a sort of a very crude approximation of the backbone. So it's not the electron density of the molecule that is behind, and you may find the um, electron density files also in the PDB if you wish to have them and to interpret them according to whatever interpretation you want to give to the electron density. Okay, so the PDB, and then the PFAM, what is PFAM? PFAM is a model of protein domains. What is a protein domain? Well, it uh, can be a particular portion of the protein structure that mm, routinely contains the active site, if it is an enzyme, or a binding site, if it is, uh, I don't know which type of molecule. So in any case, a protein domain is a subdomain of the protein structure that is peculiar of what we call a protein family. So a cluster, cluster, a set of proteins that generally, although being evolutionarily distant, they do perform the same function in different organisms. Okay. And then we have, uh, obviously, <laughs> also when we say function in bioinformatics, we refer to specific gene ontology terms. So there was a, a study, a group of people, and they are still working. Um, so it's a project uh, in which practically you generate what is called a gene ontology function vocabulary. So each function is translated practically into a number. <laughs> so we can work even with words, sentences, describing the protein function why? Because we have this vocabulary that allows us to transform each action into a number. And then I think that in the afternoon we will go a little bit through these details. Why this is important? Ha, because if I want to work with the prediction of protein function, for example, <laughs> I have to derive information, but I have to work with machine learning approaches or not on a specific file that is related to the protein sequence. And then we have this database that contains information on the sequences of the proteins. So all the protein universe of the 170 millions of proteins that are deposited, known today, after having sequencing the genomes is contained here. And uh, this database that is called UniProtKB, notice please, Uniprot knowledge base, <laughs> okay, uh, is our reference point. Why? Not because the sequence is more informative <laughs> than the structure, as many students are thinking, but because, first of all, here you have the link also to the PDB files, if they do exist. But because here you have many links to all the biochemical literature that is around describing the function of the protein. And please notice, although I cannot point it, please notice that this database also contains all the molecular function expressed in terms of geo, gene ontology terms, biological processes, and even cellular components, that means where the protein is functional, if it is known, okay? Now, now what? So how do we transfer knowledge routinely? Even in this database, because the database accepts sequences and then tries to annotate all these sequences. Well, it's very simple because after all, bioinformatics is about comparison. 
what are you doing in bioinformatics? Well, well, yeah, comparing, comparing, aligning, aligning, structural, structural sequences, etc., etc. So, in principle, the idea underlying annotation is simple. We transfer annotation, so knowledge, by search of homologies. That means, practically, determining the sequence identity. The sequence identity is something that is, again, you have algorithms that are capable of aligning position by position characters. So sequence identity means that after this operation, when I find in the alignment two characters that are the same, fantastic, I'm claiming, oh, there is an identity in that position, okay? So sequence identity, uh, the algorithm is not, there are several algorithms, and uh, again, I'm not entering into the detail of the algorithms. So I'm giving you the concept, then if you wish, if you want, you may go back home and think of it. But the idea here is very simple, like in the case that I'm showing here, I have a sequence in red, I'm applying uh, my multiple sequence alignment method, and I'm finding regions that eventually have something in common in terms of words. But here a word is a lateral side chain in a protein. Hmm? So there is something to it. Good. But then I have problems. And the problems are, which is the threshold of identity in order to transfer the function? Because suppose that the, the sequence in red has a beautiful structure. I know the function, it's an enzyme. Pff, I can write a lot of story. I know even the transition state of the protein. I don't know, I know, I know you have this thing, fantastic. But in the family, so this means proteins that eventually are aligned to this sequence endowed with the structure. The real problem is, am I allowed to transfer the function as well? Mm -hmm. Difficult. Because first of all, I have to identify, for example, in the case of an enzyme, which is the active site, and you know, verify that the active site has the same architecture even in all the proteins that I aligned with what I call my target. Okay? Good. I am not going to give you all the story. It's a long story. And the long story is as such that at a certain point, people decided to put a threshold to the sequence identity and say the following. OK, if the threshold is 30% sequence identity, above the threshold, I may claim eventually that similar sequences have similar, have the same practical structure. And uh, this is, you know, very well documented. We can go to uh, homology um, method of uh, predicting the structure or computing the structure uh, in terms of uh, homology building or method based on homology building, et cetera. But this is a totally different <laughs> uh, field. That, I mean, it is not, I, I'm not talking about this today, OK? But the idea is fantastic. If I'm able to build up a structure for the protein on the base of a template, and the template is there, and the template has been accurately determined in terms of its function. After all, the structure that I build it is good enough to tell me that I conserved in a specific position the active site, for example, of the protein, or the basic residues that are involved in the uh, molecular mechanism that leads to the protein function. Fantastic. I may go ahead and transfer the function. But if this is not the case, how can I be sure of transferring the function? And so sequence identity implies similar structure and similar function, not always. Not always, because we know that the 
scenario is rather complicated. Method for similarity search are BLAST and PsyBLAST. Methods that are, you know, around. And as I said, for structural alignment, PFAM. Mm? But there are others, huh? just to simplify a little bit methods that are necessary. Why the problem is very complicated? Well, it's very complicated because, you know, even in this, well, there was, this is taken from a, one of the several books of Lex, Lesk, Arthur Lesk on protein structure, in which uh, by now we know for sure that similar sequences may have different structures. And uh, therefore, not, there are structures that in spite of being identical or superimposable, as I'm saying, uh, they perform different function in different environment, in different compartments of the cell. So the situation is rather complicated if you take into consideration all these examples. So how can you transfer function? And this is the main question. Okay? <coughs> So there are rule of thumbs, for example, you cannot transfer the function unless the proteins are at least 70% identical. But even in this case, you know, it's a, it's a little bit difficult and problematic to go automatically. So you have to have a lot of uh, caution in uh, transferring the function and the knowledge about the function. More to it. Uh, if you are going to the databases, and the idea is very simple. So, as I said, when I define functional genomics, we know little and we want to expand this little in order to do annotation, functional annotation as well. And we have a big problem, all of us, including the people working in the database called Uniprot. And which is the problem? Ah, the problem is, you, you may see the problem from these very simple statistics. Uniprot is divided into two databases, practically. One is called Swissprot, and it contains less sequences that are, mm, are routinely, but not necessarily, linked to a PDB file. So the idea of Swissprot is that a curator is sitting in front of the computer and is checking hmm, personally what is going on with the automatic annotation system that Unipro through the years developed. So there is this database which is called manually curated, although manually curation these days means, you know, verification of the information in the file, okay? And then there is Uniprot KB. So uh, Swissprot contains some 560, 100 sequences, 560, 100 sequences these days. Uniprot contains all the millions of sequences that we were talking about. But problem is that they do also have a pipeline, we say, <laughs> of uh, uh, different algorithms that later on uh, they do knowledge transfer practically. Hmm? Based, some of them are also based on machine learning, fantastic. The idea is, although I cannot pinpoint, okay, here, it's why, that, that is why. The idea here is, in, in any case, the protein existence uh, that is recorded here in these statistics tells you that 74% of the sequences in the database, they are simply predicted. They, do they exist? We don't know, predicted. Okay, 25 are inferred by homology, and only a little percentage, 1% practically, really carries the information or the knowledge or the information that is related to, as I said, the uh, electron density of the protein, possible experiment at the mesoscopic level in which you do wet biochemistry, etc., etc., etc. Here in this slide, you have also what? Uh, a few 
website where you can expand all this notion. You can link immediately to the transfer of knowledge and the way in, in which it is done in Uniprot KB. And then you have also uh, summing up of uh, the automatic process that is going on at the, uh, in, in Uniprot, you know, taking advantage also of the PDB data. Um, I will not uh, touch anything else. So if you wish, you may go and read <laughs> yourself what's happening. Did I finish my time? No, no, uh, because now I start with our own work, so this can be skipped because it's been published. <laughs> so that was the lecture. <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you wish to have uh, details, uh, I'm here. Then we can, uh, you know, uh, in the afternoon enter a little bit uh, before using uh, what this tool among the 10 different tools that we prepared for you. But you know, I do prefer to enter in some discussion, if you wish, before entering into our way of validating transfer of knowledge. So, see. Yeah. Which is your background, may I ask you? How many bioinformaticians do I have in this audience? One. <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, your talk, I'm or I'm so far for your talk, Rita. And uh, my question, two questions. First, is how do you get over the garbage in, in this, not garbage, but uh, how do you avoid carrying errors from data in the databases to your uh, production? Or, uh, uh, and the second question is, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on uh, structure sequences, but what do you think about functionality that derives from geometrical shape and not necessarily the, se the function is derived from the sequence or, I mean, different uh, similar shapes with different sequences? May I? Yeah. <laughs> okay, first question, how do I avoid errors? No way. If you are entering some files in the Uniprot, even in the Uniprot database, it's there are errors. So how to avoid error? I have my own way of doing it. Perhaps in the afternoon we can discuss it, but obviously everything can, uh, you know, reproposed in a better way and everything can do, uh, you know, have, can have different ideas on how to try to avoid errors or mistakes. Uh, it's quite common to, to think that even sequencing, starting with sequencing, you don't have errors. This is wrong, because sequencing is uh, an enormous source of errors. Considering even the fact that in principle, annotation there is always performed uh, towards the reference, uh, and the reference genome may change through times, and the alignment methods there are, you know, prone of uh, giving you um, mistakes much more than whatever I uh, mentioned here in terms of BLAST or other alignment methods. Hmm? Why? Because they are fragment-based methods and so the shorter the fragment, uh, the more doubtful is uh, the, the, the end out results when you are aligning, just to give you my, my, my opinion, then perhaps we can debate this. Very good. So starting from there, it's quite obvious that if you apply a code for translating into a protein, <laughs> then you may have problems in generating a protein that does not exist, and then you have the problems of the isoforms, et cetera, et cetera. So here, you know, you have always to be really cautious in terms of what you are extracting from the databases. So I don't have the recipe to avoid errors. 
I may have, you know, my own view, but it's very restricted and very conservative. <laughs> I can, you know, uh, I can, we can debate it in, uh, later on. Second was uh, the shape. Ha. Ha. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, electron density the, of the protein, structure of the protein. But uh, you may agree with me that now when we say structure of the protein, first of all, we, we think in terms of a structure that, is, that is, was derived from an isolated protein from the contest. I may agree with you that shape is good for, in case of enzymes perhaps, we know so many different uh, files containing the same enzymes. So we can even detail a little bit the dynamics of the enzymes sometimes in terms of what's going on during um, the transition from the inactive to the active state, etc. Uh, even there, you know, you see that all the different methods at the end of the day can help in, uh, uh, in this transfer of knowledge. Because if the idea is function, how can I predict the function of a protein starting from what? The gene of the protein, the sequence of the protein, even the structure of the protein, because sometimes they have the structure and they don't know the function. So it's very difficult, even in that case, to predict the function of the protein if you don't find the template uh, to compare with that later on can help you in finding what? finding the protein family, because this is a big concept here, mm, an old concept that tells you, okay, I have proteins that no matter in which arg organism they are performing the same function, okay? So, mm, yes, mm, why not? I start from the sequence because I have 170 millions of cases to deal with, <laughs> but you, know, you may as well start with uh, the shape of the protein. And then there is this CAFA experiment in which you can participate. But then, what they, uh, I don't know, are you familiar with these, you know, large scale experiments? Capri, Caffa, Cagi, come si chiamava il Caffi? Casp, Casp, Casp has been the, the first one in order to predict the protein structure. No, the idea is, uh, here what they give you is tons of proteins, and uh, you have to find the function. Uh, problem, the real problem is if you want to use the shape, <laughs> perhaps none of them has been solved uh, at atomic resolution, with atomic resolution. So how can you do then shape unless you go through homology eventually and find a template uh, that gives you the possibility of transfer the function. Hmm? <laughs> okay, I have a uh, technical question. In terms of artificial neural networks, yes. um, how do you decide the number of layers? Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> uh, the, the, the formal answer is a search in the parameter space. That is your problem. <laughs> the idea is uh, they are flexible uh, methods. And so, uh, in my experience, uh, when we started with, uh, uh, this, uh, with this type of approach, the idea was, okay, we had uh, the training set, the testing set, and so we knew in advance the answer, and the idea was to adjust the architecture as a function of uh, uh, the, the, the best solution that we wanted to have because otherwise you may run into the problem of overfitting, so everything is learned by heart, and then you are lost because the system is not capable of generalizing at all. So uh, this is a problem. Everything is a problem because you have to go there and spend time and think of what you are doing. This is the... But nowadays there are, you know, I know people that they are using uh, neural networks simply uh, in, um, in remote, because they, they, there are libraries, there are systems that allows you to uh, upload your training set, and you know, then again, be cautious of what you're doing, because it, it, we are building up our layers, <laughs> but sometimes people, they do tend to use these uh, 
pre-computed uh, architecture that are around. So, again, what did I say? That you have, you have to basically, you, you should be always uh, expert in, co in a computational field, so you know what you are using. Mm? And then you should be also aware of uh, which is the biological problem. Not to say, if you want to use neural network in economy, <laughs> then <laughs> it's very difficult to find the right answer because of all this instability that is around in the global market. So, first of all, thank you for your very nice presentation. Uh, uh, secondly, my question is, uh, I really appreciate uh, how you give us some guidelines to build a model from a template, but uh, what is a good strategy to build a model when you have uh, two different templates with the same percentage of similarity? Oh. It, it, it could happen. Which is the strategy to build up a model, uh, so a protein model, yeah, you mean, exactly. when I have what? Two different, temp two different template uh, with the same uh, similarity ah, okay, okay, with okay, respect okay. to the query. So, so we are in the terrible situation in which I have the same sequence with two possible structures. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, well, it depends. If I know the function, perhaps I'm good enough in finding the protein family and trying to refer to the protein family. I know that is an art concept that nowadays is not around very much, but if you go to PFAM, after all, a PFAM is allowing you through uh, domain modeling to localize a particular set of proteins that eventually are the templates, the best template for you. So if you know the function, everything is good, but to know the function means that the protein uh, has been studied before in, in a wet lab, so it's been extracted, purified, uh, checked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have this data, you are there, simulation, <laughs> which is the best model for, it's quite, Mm, no, even simple to, to use Swiss modeler for building up a model, although I'm able to prove to my students in, in class that, you know, when it comes to the problem of, you know, metal binding proteins, it, it's always better to, to do it at home because sometimes uh, the, the template uh, that is used automatically is not the best one to conserve the number of metals that are generating the act or participating into the active site. But this is another story. Um, otherwise, the idea is you build up your protein and uh, uh, in order to, uh, to select between two models, I would go through simulation. Okay. Huh? Because simulation after all is, well, not only, but okay, the, the problem is First of all, you have to know uh, from where is your protein. At least that, do you know? Uh, in your question, if, you, if the protein is from a bacterium or from, I don't know, a higher organism, because even, even that uh, information can help you in understanding which tissue, uh, from where the protein has been derived, which is the gene, I don't know, from wh which genome, is the protein coming? So probably I should, uh, I know. So for example, uh, in modeling, problem is the template search. Hmm? Good. Now you have a sequence that is from a eukaryote, and you go there and you find a protein that is from prokaryotes. Mm. <laughs> Good. You have that, and the backbone is, you know, perhaps the backbone is good enough. The uh, problem is porous translational modification, all these stories. Uh, that makes a difference. So uh, 
I remember that uh, we, we published something totally wrong <laughs> because we used uh, as a template, uh, I don't know, perhaps 15 years ago or so, we used as a template a prokaryote protein and we had in our hand a eukaryote sequence. It happens, huh? Because computation, you, you cannot blame computation. Problem is the extent of information when you start to solve the problem that can help you, no matter which, how many layers of deep learning you are applying. <coughs> um, I have a question, a really short question. No. Um, I mean, the, the, the there, there was other, I saw other students. Around. There are other questions from students. Ah, you had a similar. No more questions. Uh, <coughs> no, mm, uh, the, 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 the final goal of the school is to, I mean, to create a, a connection between simulations and bioinformatics. So my question is... Uh, I'm in favor. <laughs> um, and if it's possible in a future, in a close future, um, in, I mean, the integration of data coming from simulation, I mean, for example, um, information about domain motions or conformational changes based on, I mean, simulation in this kind of databases in which you have functional annotation of proteins. Yes, for sure, to say. No, well. You have the microphone. Okay, uh, in my opinion, yes. Uh, indeed, for example, uh, but it's another field that I didn't touch at all, or I touched vaguely. Yeah. I said, okay, you have a mutation at the level of a gene, and then perhaps you have, uh, you know, um, a different uh, lateral side chain, and you don't know what's going on. Mm. What's going on, uh, you know, it's a problem because sometimes it can perturb protein stability. Again, even there, protein stability means that you have uh, the variation in free, in Gibbs free energy when uh, uh, you know it uh, uh, during the folding process. So you know how to change. Then the problem is how can I, uh, how much, which is the extent of variation in the uh, in the delta delta G, so in the change of free energy of the two different forms. Same protein, one residue is changed, and the idea is the protein is unstable. Good. And then, you know, how can you decide when this instability promotes the protein unfolding? That's another story. Because you, go, you, you may claim, okay, I have this change in solution. I have this change because delta delta G is in solution. Unless, okay, you may compute it, but the idea is uh, basically the validation comes from a thermodynamical on experiments that measures thermodynamics in, uh, in solution. Okay, good. Ha. How can we, you know, be aware of this data there when I'm transferring my knowledge. Bo, yes, yet we have big holes to fill in, in my opinion. But it's a second layer of information again. First of all, you have data. Data requires analysis, fantastic. Then you, you know, you add feature, and then you may, you know, have uh, simultaneously, you may go on and try to think in terms of what is the protein doing, uh, the function of the protein, if you don't know it, uh, and eventually the protein stability, even uh, dynamics of the protein in itself may change the extent of uh, surface exposure. So may change completely the scenario of protein-protein interaction. So uh, there is a lot of, that needs to be done in terms of new norms. <laughs> so we may sit down and write <laughs> our, uh, our wishes <laughs> and, th and think in terms of what can, uh, how to integrate bioinformatics with simulation, I think. Yeah. If I may add just one very short because we are out of time. 
Uh, yes, I totally agree. And the point is also another, in my opinion, that when we speak about simulations, it's really we should be very careful in understanding which kind of simulations and which kind of data we are adding, because the quality of data, as you said in your presentation, is extremely important to to develop a, a reliable model. So simulations are useful, but uh, I think my suggestion is to be uh, critic in understanding and assess the quality of the results before including these in a mm -hmm. model. That's uh, one remarkable point, my opinion. Yeah, but yeah, just, just to conclude, I mean, my, my, my question was, um, in particular, Sorry. when you have a, a, a protein and or gene, and you don't know anything about the, 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 this particular gene or protein, but you can, I mean, you can find, for example, the folds, I mean, the fold of this protein. So then you, if you have information also about the motion of the fold, then you have a complete view of, of the possible function of a protein, starting from a sequence. So, I mean, we have a limited number of folds. So in, the, in this view, maybe will be easier than integration data on mutations, function, foldings, and so on. So, um, now it's time for coffee break, and thank you again. Are there questions? No more questions? Okay, thank you again.
uh, we are ready to start the second session of the morning. It's my pleasure to leave the stage to Professor Ruben Abajan from University of California, San Diego, and Moldsoft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, well, almost good morning. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to be speaking here. Actually, I'm very excited about uh, being in Logan, and, and I thank uh, Vittorio uh, and the organizers. You know, you guys were great to organize everything so smoothly. Um, so um, it, it's unusual format also, I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, normally you never speak, usually we ask to leave the stage as soon as we start, you know, 10, 15 minutes, sometimes 50 minutes, but it's very unusual. That's why I'll be just uh, rambling forever and uh, just make some, you know, faces if you're tired of that. Um, all right, so the, I would like to, um, to start. Um, so the main um, point of the presentation is to introduce some science, but also only relevant to the topics which we're going to review in the second part of the day. And uh, uh, my, the, the basically, the broad uh, topic is uh, drug and target discovery and interactions between, typically would be small molecules, but well, of course uh, we, we go to large ones as well and protein-protein interaction, but uh, I will focus on uh, small molecule drugs versus their targets. And we'll talk about global optimization uh, 3D data and PDB, and I sh Rita actually very nicely introduced already some of the topics uh, here. And then we'll talk about the multi-target pharmacology um, and uh, chemistry sequence and, and some applications of this technology. So the, some of the slides, uh, I'll be talking about uh, material which was produced in my lab at UCSD, as well as uh, some uh, developments which were done at Molsoft um, and uh, with lead scientists Max Totroff and uh, Andrew Ori, Paul Lam. Eugene Rausch and some other people. All right, so we'll start from the PDB, and I assume that most of you know what the protein data bank is, um, but it's, it's important to uh, explain uh, some of the basics there. So, well, you know, it's, it's a large collection. There are many files, uh, over 150,000 files. Now, and uh, you need to be clear about what is in that file when you load it. Uh, and um, Usually, uh, it's important to understand that what's actually inside is something which is called an asymmetric unit, which is neither whether it's related to biology or not. Uh, so it's a part of the structure which, if you apply the symmetry of uh, this uh, crystallographic uh, unit, then you will fill out uh, one crystallographic cell, and then you need to multiply the cell. Actually, it, it allows you to reproduce the content of this infinite crystal um, but then your job is to start from this asymmetric unit and, uh, and understand how to create the uh, construct which is relevant to your problem. So you need to uh, sometimes expand crystallographic unit because it can be smaller than your uh, unit of interest. It can be also larger, usually it is larger than your unit of interest. And then you need to carve out uh, what you need. And then you need, you need to understand that it's basically, in most cases, will not be the biological complex. It will not contain the full genes. Instead, it will contain the construct uh, which uh, somebody prepared to crystallize that because it's a challenge to crystallize anything. Most biological structures don't like to be crystallized. You force them into that. Um, in particular, membrane proteins are, um, you know, you, you need to apply a lot of convincing for them to form a crystal. And uh, at the end, what you have is uh, some sort of uh, interpretable, you, you, you generate the lectin density if it's a crystallographic structure, and then uh, you, uh, you can interpret uh, some visible part of the construct. And so not all the construct will be visible, and so we need to learn how to basically uh, be able to, to clean up and find what you're interested in. So uh, PDB contains many structures, as already said, and some of them become, so increasingly it's moving in that direction. So this is a real PDB, um, and that's a structure of a capsid. And this one, as you can see, even at the macroscopic level, doesn't have the symmetry. It's a 
uh, it's a strange uh, uh, shape unit, and then it, it's seeded with certain locations, and then around them it, it forms uh, this sort of um, structure. And what you need to be aware of is, uh, well, in this, in this case, it's a, it is a biological, uh, it, it's a part of the biological system. Uh, and uh, in order to incorporate, uh, in order to basically distribute this sort of entries, PDB introduced a new format, uh, and we actually we had some influence on that. Um, it's a binary format uh, in addition to their old, um, uh, well, two old formats which PDB uses, the text form. All right, so what is relevant to our consideration? We'll be talking about ligand protein interactions in most cases. And uh, the first relevant point is that when you read PDB, you actually, in the PDB, uh, you will see the atomic model. You see the records which say atom, and there'll be X, Y, Z, uh, and then B factor and occupancy. You're supposed to know what B factor is. Who knows, who doesn't know what B factor is? We just test for honesty. Right, well, uh, many of you are dishonest, and, but I'm glad that many are honest. Uh, <laughs> so those who didn't raise your hand, I will now ask to write the formula for B factor. And that will be embarrassing also for me because I don't remember. There's four pi there somewhere there. But basically, it's, it's a measure of how smeared the position of the atom is. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, a temperature dependent kind of index. If it's large, it means that it's smeared and it's not really in the position where, which is recorded. And always occupancy, which is ideally one, uh, but in many cases it can be 0.5 or 0.3 or 0.6, 0 0.1 or zero. Uh, what does it mean when, when it's zero? And if somebody told you here's an atom here, but its occupancy is, is, is zero, what does it mean, right? Um, what do you think it means? It means that it's fantasy, right? It's somebody's fantasy. So, so what you see is not the density, which is reality, but you see the interpretation, which is the, the atomic model. And these are the, the issues you need to, to deal with. Like this is, an this is a real example. None of them are, and this is a real example. It means that there is some density, but the, in the atomic model, you actually have, have coordinates. And you have ambiguities and gaps. You know, what you don't see? Well, you don't see some missing unclear uh, parts, maybe the ligand is missing, maybe the loop is missing, maybe the side chain is missing. Missing ambiguous loops or side chains. Um, also, uh, certain things uh, are not easily um, seen in density. For example, if you have asparagine on, on one end, uh, you will have uh, nitrogen and others, oxygen, so the, uh, the electron density is almost uh, it's, it's close uh, between uh, N, O, and C. The, the, uh, the, the density is quite close, so that's why frequently you don't see uh, which one is which, and then uh, people still place it somehow, but it's, it's a guess, right? And they use, we use chemical intuition. And chemical intuition is wonderful if you have that, but the problem is that uh, my chemical intuition will be different from yours, uh, and it's always the case. So intuition is intuition. It means that it's arbitrary, right? So for all practical reasons, it's completely arbitrary. Um, so um, then the a bigger problem that this are the intrinsic ambiguities. For example, you don't see hydrogens in crystal structures in most cases at, at usual re resolutions around two. Uh, so, but the, the bigger problem is that many, uh, in many cases, there are uh, atoms in the model which are made up. They're fantasy uh, atoms. Like this, in this case, for example, somebody said, well, here's my ligand, but there's no density for it. Why the ligand is there? Well, because the, the head of the lab insisted that the, the postdoc who works on that, you know, you should find the, the it, it's there, we crystallized with that, and the whole paper depends on you finding that. And so they, under pressure, some of us basically cannot resist anymore, and we place a ligand there. So, uh, and this is the problem. So invisible atoms deposited with full occupancy you know, if, if they assign zero occupancy to that, it'll be fine. But if it, when it's full occupancy, it's a problem. In ligands, uh, frequently you can see wrong identity. Basically, you see some sort of structure, but in reality, it's something else. Somebody from the buffer crystallized there. Uh, and also, of course, this placement may be ambiguous. 
another thing which, which you need to uh, extend your model to start modeling is protonation and totemerization. Well, the hydrogens are simply not there. You know, the crystallographers, just like chemists, they don't like hydrogens. They ignore hydrogens. So uh, only polar hydrogens maybe sometimes. Um, and in chemistry, only the hydrogens which change the, the charge of a heavy atom. But, uh, so th but you need to assign them, and then uh, because they're essential for, for structure calculations. Um, uh, and then there, these are the intrinsic ambiguities. The, the histidines uh, can be um, uh, epsilon and delta, and then the histones also may rotate. There are six actually different positions of histidine with about the same density. And uh, that needs to be, um, this ambiguity needs to be removed. Then, you know, protonations in, in all of them are also uncertain. Um, well, so you would say, well, let's consider glutamic acids. Are they neutral or negatively charged? What would you say? It depends, right? But let's say if you take 99.9% uh, .9 of them, Mostly they'll be negatively charged, right? But some will not. Uh, but the crystal structure will not tell you which ones are and which ones are not. And there are several famous examples, for example, the HIV protease, where the two, ch uh, well, you would think so they're both negatively charged facing each other, but two negative charges cannot face each other. So, so one of them, at least one of them, should be uncharged for that uh, situation to exist, and you need to know where it is. Now, what about cysteine? So if, if cysteine doesn't form a disulfide bridge, uh, so will it be always protonated? It will be SH, will it be thiol? Yes, no, maybe, sometimes. Sometimes, all right. Uh, when it will not be protonated? You look at the structure and you see cysteine. What needs to be next to it to be, for cysteine to be not protonated? A metal, right? So then it's deprotonates. The, so you need to know that because the second you make a mistake and protonate that thiol, it, it, everything will break. So the, the metal will fly out and it will not work. So you need to know about protonation and the point is that it's not in the crystal, even in that model. And definitely not visible in the density. So uh, one of the goals uh, initially for us when we model is to create a uh, the full atom model uh, uh, from, from our initial uh, model in the PDB. And full atom model means that we need to basically bridge all the gaps. And if, if the side chain is missing, build it back. If the hydrogens are missing, build them, create the correct uh, uh, charge model uh, for the system. Then we have the complete system. So you need to have a complete system. And uh, then you also need to extend it to the biologically relevant uh, unit. So if you have only one, but then the Biological system is a dimer. It can be crystallographic a dimer. That's why in the, uh, it's not an asymmetric unit. Then you need to generate it using this tree. And, um, and then interpret that. Basically, um, uh, so fix all this problematic situation. All right, so this is one uh, assignment. Um, again, uh, to, uh, to emphasize the point, did I skip? No. Uh, to emphasize the point that uh, the reality is really density, and the atomic placement is, uh, is you know, well, density is also generated by humans, but, uh, but this one is uh, uh, somewhat arbitrary. And so here I show an example from one uh, ZEO where uh, this is the deposited coordinates of the atoms, but if you do redocking, you, you generate actually a better fit model with a different arrangement. So here uh, the carbonyl is on this side, and here's on this side. Uh, and basically this is much more real because everything, e energy is better and, and the placement and density is better. So, so don't, trust, uh, uh, don't trust the atomic model, but instead trust the density and, uh, and your kind of improvement, uh, your, your ability to improve the model. All right, now let's talk about the first task uh, which we'll practice uh, today. Uh, with, and then the, the task is to identify, you look at the structure and you decide that I'd like to, uh, to make it a target and I want to hit it with a small molecule. So how do we find the pockets which are, um, uh, how do we find the pockets uh, which 
can be, um, uh, uh, which are druggable. And uh, so some time ago, we developed this, this method. And, that's, and at that time, we, we uh, coined the term, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the pocket tone, basically, we, because we were thinking that it's important to collect all the pockets we know. And, and that's kind of independent from the structures to some degree, because uh, the pocket uh, can be between subunits. It can be in one subunit. And so we, and that time we developed basically the method where you take the structure and, uh, and you try to create the shape which captures the perfect placement of a small molecule. Uh, the, uh, you know, skipping the math, but basically it's, it's some form of the, so you generate some sort of uh, uh, physical force field and then you expand it um, uh, with, uh, with a certain convolution uh, transformation and then you contour it at a certain length uh, so it will, so optimize and then you get the envelope. So we'll be able to take any structure and you will ask the question, what can I target on that structure? And you may discover something completely new which nobody have targeted before, which looks targetable, uh, and, then, um, uh, and then take that shape and start looking for small molecules which can fit into that. So um, for technical details, look into the original paper, otherwise, We'll, we'll watch that movie again and again. Uh, all right, so, the, uh, so this process generates you a bunch of uh, shapes. And uh, the first and obvious uh, criterion would be, well, if something is too open, there will be no shape. If something is just the right shape, uh, that it will uh, give you this envelope. And then the volume of this envelope is the first and simple criterion of uh, targetability. Typically, you want to have something over 200 uh, cubic angstroms, um, uh, so ideally 300 or so, uh, then, then it's a drug-like uh, size. So what are the other parameters? Uh, some people at, uh, um, at Merck, they published this paper in 2010 where they took our uh, pocket finder method and they uh, calculated some other parameters, fraction buried, for example, and hydrophobic fractions, polar fractions. And then they um, developed an index in addition to the volume, which uh, they call DLID, drug-like density, D drug-like density. So, uh, and this index, you know, if it's not zero, if more than zero, more than 0.5, it's considered druggable. So in addition to the, to the shape and location, you can also have this indices. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure that whether we need anything except volume because you know, if it's totally hydrophobic, then you, you, your ligand is going to be hydrophobic. It's half polar, then you, you will have. So in other words, through the ligand, you can basically compensate for the properties of the pocket. But uh, yeah, you can consider some sort of middle ground. OK, once we have the pocket, what, what do we want to do? We want to start uh, screening and docking. So the docking is the first uh, uh, assignment. And, and on the way to the. Uh, to, the, to building a model of a target, of course, you can do more optimization, more prediction. Um, but then um, after that, there is, uh, there is sampling. And so what we've done uh, some time ago, uh, now a long time ago, is develop, to develop this method which uh, we called internal coordinate mechanics, ICM. And internal coordinate mechanics was an attempt to reformulate molecular mechanics from the simple formulation of Cartesian mechanics uh, to mechanics in internal coordinates. What are the internal coordinates? Well, internal coordinates, you need to imagine kind of a robotic system, a tree-like system, which you build from the origin. And for each, for each next point, you have the, the length and the angle and the torsion angle, which defines that branch. And so this is a set of variables, which is uh, very natural for molecules. Mathematically, it's, uh, it's quite unpleasant because Every next atom depends on the previous part of the tree instead of being independent like in Cartesian. But if you, if you have nothing to do and then you, you don't mind mathematics, uh, you can do that. And, uh, and we've done that. And so we developed quite an uh, efficient method for, uh, to operate in internal coordinates and also develop the, the stochastic global optimizer, which is a powerful predictor. Um, uh, and with that optimizer, you can take any system, you can define what, are the, what is the subset of variables which you would like to sample? Uh, there is an energy function. 
Um, uh, and then you, you run this global optimizer, and, and uh, this is some properties of this global optimizer. While it uses the uh, uh, a large scale random moves in which it uses fragments. Uh, so the fragment, uh, uh, the, the local fragments can be populated and they, uh, and then the, the, the moves are made according to the square root of the observed uh, local frequency of those fragments. And that square root sampling then later on became particularly important because it turns out that uh, one mathematician who was working on the technique to sample for terrorists. Uh, he uh, kind of reinvented, ten, 10 years later, reinvented the square root sampling, and then he found our work, and then he quoted that, well, we invented this, but then we found that somebody else already have done the square root sampling. And you know, the, here the idea is simple. Like if you have the population, which is, let's say, 100 times more frequent, more likely to be a terrorist, when you sample them in the airport, your optimal sampling would be not sample them 100 times uh, more frequently, but only 10 times more frequently. Then this way, you know, you, um, you, uh, it, it's, it's a statistically more, uh, more reasonable sampling. So uh, you make these moves in, in uh, local collective moves, and then after each one of them, you perform the gradient optimization, so the function needs to be minimized. The energy is evaluated in, in these different uh, valleys, and then you accumulate the low energy states, and uh, in your history of your search affects the, the search. Like, you know, imagine that you search for this room, and then you, you walk around the campus, and then once you visited some place two times, you don't want to go there again. So the, this machine has all these parameters how to control the search. And uh, so, it, you know, uh, and it's quite general. So you can apply that sampling uh, uh, technique to anything. So I'll skip the map. This is just shown to, to scare people. Usually it, it, it makes, but it's, it's, it's from our publications. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't, um, I don't intend to go through that. But if you want me to, I, I can. Um, but usually it's just to show, uh, well, this is the derivation of this formula for the square root sampling, which is the summing up a, you know, an infinite series. Uh, uh, and, uh, but it doesn't really matter. At the end, what matters is that now we can take, um, uh, we can take um, any system and say, well, in this system, we're interested in, uh, in keeping everything rigid except for a certain area, and we want uh, let's say that part of the loop and those side chains be flexible, everything else can be rigid, and then the ligand is, is totally rigid, and uh, so the, the sampler will find the, the number of states uh, which have low energy. And then, the, um, then, we, uh, then we need to start uh, basically further uh, developing that because for screening, now let's talk about the docking screen. So if you do a docking screen, you want to dock not just one, not two, not 10, but a large number of molecules. What is the number? What do you think? So how big are the libraries we, we're screening today? Millions? Billions. Rita knows, yes. Uh, exactly. So yeah, it was, well, 20 years ago, definitely, Novartis was very proud to have 200,000 molecules, and Sana said 200,000 uh, So. The collections were in hundreds of thousands. Then it progressed to close to a million, uh, and then it was in this area for a while. And now companies like Animin, for example, they promise to sell you, they, ha they have a collection which is currently 680 millions, but their new release will be uh, in multiple billions. And whatever you order from that catalog, uh, they say 80% of them they will give you. So it is still based on their uh, fragments and the chemistry, uh, but so these are the these are the number of molecules we need to work with. If you want to 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 uh, dock even a million, forget a billion, then you need something else. And something else was developing the uh, this uh, grid energies and um, grid energies. So one of the things we've done is the grid energies, which are um, uh, which. Um, represent uh, the static part of the structure, 
but we learned how to make multiple grid energies in the same location so that the docking is with the same speed, but the memory of all the conformational states is stored on those grids. So we call them 4D grids, because 3D will be one grid, and, and if we have multiple, we call them 4D, uh, because one extra dimension is just the, uh, what is the particular conformation. So we can take, uh, let's say, if you have a simulation, or if you have your bunch of crystallographic structures with different variations of the structure, we can convert them into this 4D grid, and then with the grids, the docking is much faster. So it, in seconds, it can correctly dock the ligand. So there are different uh, ways to, uh, to incorporate uh, fl pocket flexibility, because of course, for each ligand, when it binds to the pocket, uh, there is a phenomenon called induced fit. It means that the ligand, to some degree, induces certain changes, which you will not see without that ligand. You change the ligand, and it'll be a different induced fit. Um, so, uh, and so we basically de had to develop uh, different induced fits. I know it's confusing, but for, for different situations, uh, and depending on the, on the task and the situation, we use different ones. So this one is this, what I mentioned, 4D, which is a collection of different uh, stationary states, and ca which can be also converted into grids, and then it becomes very, very fast. Uh, I'll talk about pocket on later. Um, then we can explicitly sample things, then it, it, things become slower. This method uh, was um, the, the um, killed developers were, were Max and, and Giovanni. Giovanni was the first author on that paper for Fudi Dokken, Giovanni Bottegoni. Sorry for truncating his, no, it's, uh, on my slide it's complete, so for that the, the screen is truncated here. Um, uh, and uh, so the scare method is actually qu quite uh, interesting. In scare method, what we do is we, uh, we identify pairs of interacting side chains, and then we replace uh, pairs of them by alanines, and then uh, and we create a, a series of uh, this um, uh, basically structures with emitted side chains, and then we dock the ligand into each one of them, and then we bring uh, them back and refine, and turns out it's quite efficient. Uh, to imitate uh, the, the full sampling and induced fit in those structures. For the recent competition, uh, there is this method um, uh, called lig bend, um, and uh, that, that method uh, gave us the, the top performance in the competition. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a big achievement of Max uh, Totorov primarily um, for the lig bend, and so he, he's the, the lead author on that. Uh, and uh, so that uses uh, in yet another idea, and the idea is that if you have something already co-crystallized in this pocket, you can use it as a guide uh, in a soft way without disturbing the docking too much, and you would use the pocket uh, uh, with some uh, tricks, and then you would also use this guide in addition. So uh, now when we dock uh, the ligand, and then we, we get the, a set of poses, we usually would like to consider only the best pose, the, the lowest energy pose. But then we need to reevaluate uh, and take that pose and calculate the something which we, well, ideally it's a free energy of binding, but, but it's, uh, it's presumptuous to call it a free energy of binding. We call it the binding score, right? Just to be humble. If you're not humble, you can say, well, this is free energy of binding. But you know, if you're humble, it's just some score, you know, it's useful. Uh, and which units, arbitrary units. Um, and, but we optimize, how do we derive this binding score? We take uh, the uh, you know, large fraction of the PDB where we have the bound positions and uh, multiple ligands for this. So each, each line here is a particular protein structure and, and each red dot is a particular ligand. And so we uh, optimize the binding score to separate the red dots, which are the, the real ligands bound to that structure from the black dots and when you optimize that function on a large number of complexes, you can derive the weights and you can derive the parameters of the scoring function. And this scoring function contains, you know, the fit, the ligand strain, the hydrogen bonding, the dissolvation, uh, the entropic terms, and, and many other kind of tricks which uh, help us to separate the right from the wrong. Um, yes. Oh. 
Oh, that's, I mean, it's just, it's fine. No, no. Yeah, if something is, well, if something uh, is not broken, then nothing, there is nothing to expect. So if something is slightly broken, but still kind of working, then don't touch it. <laughs> this is a, all right, so this is to show you that um, uh, also what you can do, so th this is a relatively large ligand, and it's challenging to dog that. So this one is a 12 residue peptide, and we were playing quite a bit with uh, improving the peptide docking because it's a, uh, it's a challenging um, uh, process. Also, uh, clearly the, the rigid geometry, um, rigid covalent geometry is not, uh, doesn't work well for, for peptides. You need to have additional uh, angle soft, but then, you know, uh, this relatively uh, short simulation in the internal coordinate space uh, generates uh, the, the right structure um, and as the lowest energy and uh, don't remember how long is the recording, but uh, at some point it will form something you will see as, uh, yeah, like this one, see. Now the peptide tells us, now I'm happy, it's the lowest energy, and then, and then basically it's done. All right, so now let's talk about the applications, how we, so far we talked about the pocket identification and the optimization. So what do we need to do? Well, we'll we, we need to take the model of a target surface and we'll uh, practice that. We need to predict the pocket uh, and then perform a docking screen. And then, of course, experimental testing because any prediction is just a prediction, right? Uh, don't, don't think that uh, the end of your work as a, as a modeler is just to produce a model. No, the end is to reach the result and to test it experimentally. Otherwise, it's just a waste of, uh, of your time and everybody's time. So um, in, this, uh, in this paper, which we published with, with uh, uh, David Lomas, uh, now he's in UCL that time, he was in, in Cambridge. Um, we took this alpha-1 antitrypsin. There is a form, uh, there is a mutant form of this uh, protein which uh, creates um, emphysema uh, in those patients and, and uh, you know, chronic emphysema uh, leads to high risk of lung cancer. And we, we run the, the pocket finder. The pocket finder gives you this, this shapes. And we decided to target this one. Nobody targeted that before. Um, 1.1 uh, million molecules docked against this. Uh, we take the top you know, 10 or 20, test them, and we find, um, uh, we find some interesting uh, inhibitors, which then uh, slow down the progression of the disease. And so the, the patent was filed and everything. So the, uh, that's one of the example when we basically uh, predict the pocket, target it, so no, and, and this is a kind of what's called first in class, so uh, people don't, um, um, d never targeted this one. But you, you can see that, you can see the shape here, and you can see that you can target that, and then at the end, uh, you can find also a small molecule. That's another paper, so I, I was, since we are now being recorded, and I'm not supposed to talk about that because it's still in revision. So it's a second revision, but it's, it's a great paper. So, and, and this work is uh, also not another practical lesson. So it's a fantastic paper. It was done 12 years ago. But because it's good, then you, the, you know, your reviewers are gonna try to delay it and uh, put it down. Uh, <laughs> but now we have all the elements, including the crystallography. Uh, of that, and th th it's, this is about the, uh, the casein uh, kinase 2, and casein kinase 2 is involved in several cancers, um, and it's interesting because it has the beta subunit which forms uh, a protein-protein interaction, and this is about a discovery of a new type of uh, modulators of this uh, CK2 kinase, and it's in collaboration with, uh, uh, with Claude Cochet, uh, uh, who started that, and then many um, uh, so several uh, uh, French groups and then a German group and the British group, uh, so Paul, Paul Brayer and, and so uh, it's a long list, but all the wonderful uh, people. So we, it's, it's not published. That's why close your eyes as I, uh, and delete that in the recording. Uh, uh, <laughs> right, so but I wanna show you this, so like how we approach that. Well, here's a Cassian uh, kinase too. So that's the uh, kinase domain. 
It has the active site. We didn't want to target that, but there is a beta subunit. And beta subunit uh, binds here, and beta subunit defines the specificity of that kinase. We wanted to, when we separated them, we, we saw that there could be a pocket, but the pocket was clearly flexible, and we generated a set of confirmations of that pocket through a process which we call fumigation. Well, here you probably don't do fumigation. In California, we do uh, apply fumigation. Um, uh, when you have, um, you know, termites in your house, and because it's very dry, uh, and that's the only insect we uh, come across, um, so then you cover your house with uh, with a tent, and then you put there some toxic gas or nitrogen without oxygen, and uh, and then the termites uh, die basically in that environment. So, so the analogy with this is that. We have some pocket, but it's closed down. The side chains are sitting inside. We need to kind of fumigate them uh, uh, around. And then we generate this uh, different confirmations. We run the, the pocket finder and we select, here we selected one, two, three, four confirmations. Um, and then we take all four, and we, we don't know which one is, will be suitable for a small molecule. We screen, we select the chemicals, uh, and uh, after that, um, we test them, um, uh, and, uh, and indeed we find some molecules. And, and now uh, it created a whole, uh, so the chemist uh, um, uh, started uh, generating variations in this. Now that we have a crystal structure proving that uh, our molecules indeed bind where we say they will, and uh, um, uh, the, crystallization uh, the, the crystal structure confirms the predictions and then allows us to move further. And so hopefully this paper will be out in hopefully a couple of weeks, but we don't know. So they're still uh, sitting with the editor. All right, so, the, um, so this process can be applied to discover new, new targets, new pockets, target them, and find new uh, chemical matter which, which uh, binds to them and affects the function. All right, now uh, the simplest method which we already mentioned of uh, some flexibility in the pocket is what we call the 4D docking. So when, when you have multiple confirmations uh, available either in the PDB directly because, um, well, you know, if some protein is crystallized and you can find it in the PDB, do you think it will be just uh, there one instance or there will be multiple instances of the same protein? Multiple, how many? Right, so I think Rita has the right, it's like you, you showed a hand with five fingers. Yeah, the median used to be five. Uh, five, seven, yeah, something like that. So basically, the logic is this. Once something is done, it's crystallized, it's very tempting to keep you know, redoing that, maybe with different ligands, and there'll be multiple. Each one of them will be slightly different, some dramatically different. Some will capture, let's say, an open and closed state, or some different states. So that's why there is a redundancy. And this redundancy, you can convert into the uh, concurrent confirmations if you superimpose all those structures, and then you can use those uh, um, uh, concurrent confirmations to dock. Um, all right. Now, a more advanced method um, of creating those confirmations, which we've never seen um, for a new functional state, is um, through the process which we call ligand guided modeling. So, so imagine that you have a pocket which is not even a pocket, it's closed. But you know that there is a bunch of ligands which bind there, you know from the binding experiments, not from crystallography. You don't know how they bind. So now the question is like, can you take that information about binding and convert that into improved models? And this uh, ligand, gu ligand guided uh, modeling basically. And, and um, Another great Italian scientist, uh, William Bisson. I noticed that th there is a city called Bissone somewhere on the way, and I, maybe that's, that's where he's coming from. Uh, but, you know, uh, he was the first author in that paper, discovery of uh, anti antigen activity of, of some uh, cancer medication. And uh, I also have another application where we basically predicted the, the agonist-bound confirmation of uh, beta-2 adrenergic receptor while we were starting with, uh, from antagonist bound confirmation. And so what you do is that you take these different ligands which you know bind there and you start changing your model 
and watching the discrimination between actives and non-actives. So this is called an, um, uh, a rock curve, um, receiver operator characteristics. I don't know, how many of you know rock and AUC? How many of you don't know rock and AUC? All right. Uh, so why don't like the ones you know explain to the ones who don't know <laughs> about, about the same number? <laughs> well, okay, let me explain. Uh, okay, you see, so you build a plot. So imagine that you have two pools of molecules. One uh, is set, let, let's call one binders, another non-binders, right? And you have some predictive uh, method. So you predict uh, some parameter uh, which says your binder, your non-binder. Now this predictive predict method will not be ideal. Then you start counting, uh, like every time you have a good prediction, so that's a binder, and it's indeed a binder, then you go vertically up. If it's a, a non-binder experimentally, then you, you go right. So if you have a perfect uh, recognition, your, your, your prediction is perfect, it goes like this. And then the AUC uh, stands for area under curve. So the area will be one if it's both units are one, right? Or hundred percent. But if you if you, if it's random, if you like, if your param if you assign a random, uh, if you, your predictive uh, method is bad, then it'll be kind of around diagonal, fifty percent. So the area under curve of this characteristic, where you plot false positive rate versus true positive rate, uh, uh, gives you the how good is your model. And you can actually improve your model by, uh, you can watch improvement of your model by seeing how your predictive uh, number, which will be the binding score to your, to your impro improving model, how it improves. And so optimizing this AUC allows you to improve the model uh, at the same time. And uh, we published uh, before the crystal structure of the first agonist bound uh, uh, um, was published, we published uh, the paper where de which describes that model. It says which helix moves by how many uh, angstroms, what are the hydrogen bonds established, all these details. Like two years later, uh, it was crystallized uh, after we published this. Uh, it was crystallized and was, uh, was amazing accuracy, 0.1 angstrom accuracy um, and 0.9 for the pocket, uh, it was accurate. So we, what we predicted through this process by changing the model and improving AUC led to the correct uh, model of the agonist binding to GPCRs. Right, so I mentioned uh, uh, the SCARE method. So the SCARE method is, is this cyclic permutation of uh, amino acids into alanines and then docking and then kind of uh, constraining the ligand in this position and the replacing the uh, re-optimized on the side chains. And uh, that leads to, to good predictions. So this is uh, uh, where um, uh, primarily uh, under, under uh, Max Totrov's uh, guidance, the uh, competition in, in different uh, uh, D3R uh, challenges. And you see that the, um, our uh, scores um, are excellent. So the top score post 195, amount of uh, five is 1.7. So here we just use the, the, uh, the lowest energy score and this is other teams competing, maybe you uh, contributed to that as well, um, but we like to uh, to brag about this. Uh, and and so here is uh, an example of how accurate the prediction. So this prediction, of course, was not complete, was not aware at all about the uh, the crystal structure. And this is the crystal structure which was revealed after the competition. Uh, uh, so this is a difficult case when there were dramatic changes, and but still the predi prediction captured uh, some essential positions of the ligand. And it was 17 and 18, and, and uh, I know that uh, Max also has done a very good job on in, in 19 as well. All right, let me skip that. So what else can we do with this uh, technique? Well, um, if you discover a drug, so the drugs roughly can be divided into two classes. One, the majority will be molecules which bind to the target in a non-covalent manner, right? But there are also drugs which, which form covalent bonds with the receptor. Who can name 
one drug which, is, which forms a covalent bond with the receptor. Or with, with which one? Omeprazole. Omeprazole, yes. Right, but something more frequent. Aspirin, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, so they form a covalent bond, and uh, forming the covalent bond, it's a, it's a, it's a very delicate. So if you are the drug designer, you need to think twice. What is your consideration? Well, meprazole is nice, but you know we published now already one paper, and will be one more. Uh, so that it's actually a bad drug. So uh, meprazole, nesameprazole, they have serious side effects. Vision, hearing, uh, dementia, early onset if you take chronically that, and all kinds of things. So, um, so the consideration for covalent binding is the following. First, you, you need to have an amino acid which will form that covalent uh, bond. What are, you, what are the amino acids which don't mind to be covalently bound to? Since you know, uh, uh, so what's the easiest one, which is like when you see that, you say, oh, well, you know, we'll develop a covalent inhibitor. The easiest is cysteine, right? Then the next would be serine, threonine, and you basically can uh, look at the kinases. What do they um, uh, modify? Well, you know, tyrosine. So basically hydroxyl would be a fair target. Uh, thiol is even easier target. Um, and if you have the cysteine somewhere, you may think, oh, I can, I can develop a covalent inhibitor. So now uh, we developed uh, this extension. So basically, uh, in ICM, there is an extension where you define a set of reactions, uh, which I allowed, and then uh, you take a bunch of ligands, and if the uh, method identifies the fragment which can form a, this chemical reaction with, let's say, cysteine, um, it will covalently attach it and will start sampling in the covalent state. Because if you have a covalent bond, it's very restrictive. At least you know one anchor point. You don't need to dock the whole thing. Um, several caveats here. So one is that a good covalent ligand would like uh, to be docked there before the bond is formed. And that gives you some specificity. So in other words, if you want to design a good one, first develop a non-covalent inhibitor and then uh, bridge this, the appropriate location in this inhibitor to the system. Because you would like to have that part, otherwise you don't want a non-specific covalent like which uh, it gets attached to every system because there are just way too many of them. And it will be extremely toxic. Right, but so here we can, we can basically define these reactions and we can uh, start doing that. And so this is, uh, many, many of the proteases are conducive to, to the covalent reaction because if the uh, enzyme catalyzes reaction where the, the covalent bond is formed, then it's, you can also have a drug which basically uh, exploits that option. Right, so somebody evaluated, uh, some nice people evaluated uh, different methods for covalent docking and, and the ICM came up as the, as the most accurate. We're very proud of that because you know when somebody else evaluates you and they praise you, it's valuable. Um, especially if you don't know them. Right, now let's talk about drugs and targets. And we would like to start from, from this gentleman. Who is that gentleman? What's the name? It's on the money. Is he the head of Deutsche Bank? No. His name is Paul Ehrlich. So the, uh, <laughs> and he introduced this he introduced, uh, well, I don't know, so that was, uh, that's not a euro, right? So that, well, you, re you don't remember this money. I still remember this money, that's why. Uh, um, right, so he invented this term, die uh, magische Kugel. And, and um, so the idea is that the, and that's, we were so proud that in Western medicine, we don't consider the complex body and all the fluids and, and weird things we say. We just want to find one target and take this uh, magic bullet and shoot that target. So one bullet, one target. Um, and uh, so that was the basis for all this, uh, you know, pharma industry and pharmacology. And then what happened over time is that it was successful, of course. Uh, and this is one target. 
I wanted to put Federer here, but I decided that it will be insensitive in Switzerland. Um, so, <laughs> right, so one drug, one target, right? But then uh, uh, what over the time uh, it became clear that definitely the same target can be targeted with multiple drugs. Sometimes they would bite even next to each other. In, in cytochrome, several molecules uh, together. But you know, basically one drug can be hit by multiple, uh, sorry, one target can be hit by multiple drugs. We all know that. Like once company A came up with a new inhibitor of uh, you know, HDAC, so then 20 other big uh, pharma companies will also have their uh, chemicals, and it'll be different chemicals. But what's even more surprising is that, uh, that the same drug will always, if it's a small molecule, bind to multiple targets. It's not an exception. It's not something you should be afraid of. That's a reality. You may close your eyes and you may pretend that it's not like that, but it is like that. So, and we were very kind of uh, fascinated by that idea. Uh, and e even the name is, uh, say, well, these are off-target effects, so they are bad. No. Uh, they're inevitable and they're, they're not off-target. All of these targets are uh, legitimate um, uh, targets, and that's what real pharmacology is. So how do we call that? Well, some people call it polypharmacology. Uh, I was uh, asked uh, never to use that term by Richard Lewis, uh, uh, who, who is a Novartis, and um, Richard told me that uh, if you have a drug, it, it, there is some pharmacology, and this is just a pharmacology. It's not polypharmacology. So you can call multi-target pharmacology, but not polypharmacology, because there's only one pharmacology. Is that, am I clear? <laughs> right, okay. So uh, what are the effects of this uh, multi-target? So basically one drug hits multiple things. Well, some of them are maybe harmful. That's why people are afraid of them. Some are neutral, you just don't care or don't feel it, and some are beneficial. And what we should try to do is A, uh, ability to predict the reality, and B, uh, exploit the beneficial part and stay away from the harmful part. That's a skill in, um, in drug design. So the, um, the binding to these different targets will not be at the same concentration, so there will be actually a variation of uh, uh, these KD values, and KD is the dissociation constant. Who doesn't know what dissociation constant is? <laughs> Just be, be honest. Yeah. Right. It's the equilibrium constant. We, we, we like dissociation just because it has the units of concentration. Normally you would, you would say, well, I'm interested in binding, not in dissociation. But it's, it's the flip side of binding is dissociation, and the binding constant for dissociation will be the product of the concentration of the, um, of the free uh, molecules divided by the bound state. And it has the unit of the concentration. That's why it's convenient. So the KD uh, will have the units of the concentration. And for drugs, you would like to have KD in the nanomolar range. Most of the drugs will, will, will be like 10 to 40 nanomolar, some will be picomolar. Uh, so, and if you take the negative log of that, that's letter P. So every time you see a low case P in front of something, pH will be the negative log of uh, hydrogen uh, H plus concentration. And so PKD will be negative log of the uh, KD, which is also a concentration. So we look at those numbers, um, and uh, for different targets, there will be different numbers. But anything above six we will take, so it, it's, it's, it, it creates a real biological effect. So um, recently we published this paper, um, just a couple of months ago, uh, and uh, under the name DNAT, where we looked at, at the real pharmacology of all the ca cancer drugs. And so this is just an example, a random example, crisotinib, you go to the drug bank, and drug bank was very proud that they started telling you about this multiple drugs multiple targets. And the drug bank will say, well, crizotinib inhibits ALK kinase and CMET. 
fine, too, well, you know, unpleasant, but too off target. What is the reality? What really chrysotnib does? This. So it inhibits all of those. And, and the, this color means that there's a kinases. It means uh, it, it, it's, ex it's so experimental. It's not a prediction. It's an experimental characterization, right? And that's what the chrysotnib um, multi-target pharmacology is. If the reality is this and not this, uh, it doesn't matter that who developed that, they first targeted, let's say, I don't know, uh, ALK kinase. It doesn't matter. And what matters is that what really happens in the body. Right, so th this is, uh, and we, we basically collected all this information for all the cancer drugs and, and created this uh, uh, d data resource. Um, and then our ambition, so this picture is uh, the experimentally characterized multi-target binding of, of, of this small molecule uh, inhibitor. Uh, but we really want, uh, we understand that this experimental knowledge is also limited. So experimentally established um, uh, data is a good start, but we need to go beyond that and we need to learn how to predict the real pharmacology uh, because we want a full picture. And uh, so this is the, uh, shows you what KD values are significant. It depends on the concentration of the drug. The higher concentration you have, that the high is the fraction of inhibition of your target. Um, and uh, so in order to, to be able to expand the multi-target pharma pharmacology uh, and um, uh, discover new, uh, new targets of, of already known drugs, we developed this um, uh, pocketome. Pocketome is a collection of structures superimposed. Uh, uh, the target is the same, but the, it, there are all kinds of different ligands in, in that target in the PDB. PDB now has over 150,000 molecules. And you can now look at that from two points of view. You can look at those flexible pockets. You can look at the ligands, and you can convert that density into some sort of pharmacophoric density. And, uh, and both can be used as a, as a target to, to predi for prediction. So uh, we convert them into models so that uh, Pocketom is just the data, but the models will be in the, in the Molsoft uh, uh, set of files, which are called Mol Screen, and there are uh, over 3,000 uh, prepared models. So each model here is a dot. And now we can start throwing molecules against that model um, and um, and then each of the chemicals will be docked to this multiple superimposed structures using also the, the, uh, the ligand density um, and uh, will predict the activity because you can also train, after you have the pose, you can train on, on uh, Campbell data, uh, you can uh, train to predict, uh, you can tr uh, develop the um, machine learning model which actually predicts KD from the pose. All right, so these models, uh, we, uh, you know, they're already prepared. It's very easy to use them. So instead of just configuring that for a long time and doing all that, so it's just a file and you say, here's my, you know, million molecules and run them against these 25 models and you will have 25 activities predicted at the same time. Uh, and uh, so this set of files is in the mall screen there are different types of models. We not, not only we, so we like, of course, to dock to pockets and also dock to ligand superposition. Um, and these are our, you know, our most accurate models. We call them DFA, so they have all the, this uh, prefix. But also, we don't mind if, if there's no structure at all and there's only data about the activity, we don't mind having the, um, the activity prediction based on descriptors, so the usual QSR uh, models. So it's a mixture of all types of models. So now uh, here's a validation, like the very first validation was, um, was a part of this story. So there is a drug called Praziquantel. And Praziquantel, um, well, hopefully none of you have uh, uh, schistosomiasis, but you know, uh, it's one of the, against uh, s some of the uh, eukaryotic parasites uh, pr uh, Prasequantil's use, it's an efficient drug, but the problem is that nobody knows how it works. Uh, and um, 
two labs who were, which were f funded for, for that. They, uh, they came to me, and so the, at the end, uh, the key person was um, uh, Jonathan Marchant uh, from Canada. So the, uh, and they said, well, we'd like to know uh, what it hits. And I ran for the Quantel and, uh, against, um, um, against the, the panel. And then the top, so here is the result. Uh, but you know, I just run against w what I have because even though I, I, I didn't have the pocket of, of this particular um, parasite, because, plus there are many different parasites, I just run against the models I have. And the, the top uh, hit was this 5-HT uh, receptor 2B. Uh, this is the uh, serotonin receptor which is involved in, in, in depression uh, suicide and so on, and that was the top hit. So then uh, we, we tested it experimentally, and then indeed uh, it was shown to, to hit that receptor in the human body. It, it doesn't quite uh, give us the bridge to what it does in the, in the fluke, um, but uh, it definitely reveals a new target of, of this drug and shows even the difference between the uh, two stereoisomers of Project Quantum. So that's a recent, um, a recent publication which basically validates this method. All right, um, I'm doing on time. Oh. Yeah? No, no, I mean, well, um, the question like, are you tired? Yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no that, it, this is fair, I, I am also tired. Uh, uh, and yeah, so basically, yeah, we can, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we can, if you, if you want, we can just, uh, have a little break and then, um, you, you, or you may ask questions and then I will resume. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. How do you cope with this problem? Uh, because, you know, everybody right. has the same amount of proteins, but the idea, or perhaps the same proteins, <laughs> we don't know right, right. exactly. But the idea is that the many drugs that are conceived uh, in, in relation to specific um, maladies or diseases, right. uh, they have a percentage of cases in which they totally fail. Right, right. And well, you are your computations, uh, <laughs> uh, what would, I mean, because you, you, you may approach this problem uh, with the panel of proteins that you have in different conformation and possibly different interactions and blah, blah, blah. So uh, how right, would you so this, deal this is with this, this problem? Is a, this is an excellent question. So, the, so basically, uh, there are multiple levels of things which we already understand how they may affect the drug action. And um, ideally we should know them, but in, in, of course, in the medical practice, it may or may not be known. So what are those levels? Well, first, the easiest these days, because everyone is doing sequencing, is sequencing, right? Uh, and there is, there is a mutation. So. Um, for example, some people take a drug and then there is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So there's a very strong allergic uh, reaction. They will cover it uh, with rash. Uh, there is some uh, antivirals which bind to HLA underneath the peptide, which changes the presentation of the peptide, which creates a strong immune reaction. But the patient needs to have that particular uh, version of the HLA, 1501 star. Uh, now, when we do our part, we don't know what the patient has. Uh, well, the, okay, so the, the genetics, the mutations you may learn about, the, the uh, specific immune kind of status is much more difficult because it's the next level. Then you have epigenomics, and then you have expression, right? And um, there is mysterious things related to, uh, you know, in terms of, um, Metabolism, of course, it, it's uh, strongly dependent on the age, gender, um, and, and a particular status. So 
so you, what you can do is uh, develop some sort of uh, models which exploit those rare cases. Uh, usually FDA uh, is trying to follow uh, the, the progress. For example, the FDA now requires that you characterize um, uh, activity of your drug against seven uh, 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 transporters, right? Previously, they, it doesn't matter, but now they say, tell us about seven transporters. PGP, BCRP, and like there it's uh, O at one, O at three, OPT, uh, and so on. And uh, why do they want uh, to insist on this seven in, and, and ignore the other, you know, hundreds? Um, well, because they know that uh, if you have something about PGP, then it, it will not be absorbed or it will come out from, you know, it, it affects metabolism. And if it's, uh, if your drug modulate that, you may have uh, an unusual effect. So, sorry, it's, it's, not, it's not a simple uh, answer, but uh, it's, a, it's a serious uh, a question and serious problem. And I, deal, I think over time in medical practice, uh, some of the tests which make sense, they will become more abandoned and will be become not so expensive. And we'll start then incorporating them into uh, recommendations of the drug. Right. You mentioned before that on average we have possibly five different structures for each protein in the PDB or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, often uh, the root mean square deviation at the level of the backbone can be rather high, so you think in terms of different conformation. So when you are running your simulations, are you considering uh, docking for each of the five or are you sort of uh, playing around with a sort of consensus structure? Or I, I didn't understand that specific point. Sorry. Well, for, for the multiple structures, uh, it's just the first step. Um, well, if you take a structure, well, the bi the first let's look at the big, the, fir the first point is the big changes. And the big changes is, uh, I don't know, open receptor or activated, not activated, right? Big changes. So you need to be careful not to mix these different stages in one. You need to s separate to one stage. Within one stage, there is also smaller variation uh, in the pocket. So the, what I was talking about is uh, how to incorporate the smaller variation without, going, without um, uh, you know, insisting on like full simulation of that, but just recording the uh, known distinct confirmations for the smaller variation into the grids, uh, multiple grids in the same location. What do you want me to do? Uh, no, no, I, I have I have slides. I, yeah. You can you can break out an interpretive dance and do anything you want. By the way, so. Can I? So my question is, uh, uh, it's like the second part of the question of Professor, Professor Casadio. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I understood correctly, uh, we had the database with, mil with billions of compound. Then you study all of, the, all of this compound uh, exploding dogging with different conformations. So somehow we are going in a direction that we are multiplying the complexity of the system over and over and over. Mm -hmm. But, uh, this is my opinion, I read carefully in literature about drug design several times, but even uh, with this, uh, I mean, with, with this uh, huge amount of calculation, we are still fixed uh, on a ratio of obtaining one useful drug for uh, every 100,000 uh, trials. In your opinion... No, 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 no. No, the success rate of uh, regular small molecules is, uh, uh, in clinical trials is 1 in 10. For antibodies, it's 9 in 10, right? For, uh, for CNS drugs, it's, f it's 5 in 100, so it's basically 5%. But it's, it's not 1 in... Uh, so if the drug passed all the preclinical trials yeah, on mice and rats, 
then it's one in 10 for the likelihood of, of going through the uh, FDA approval. Well, why do you say one in 10,000 or 100,000? Yeah, no, so, so sorry, but I, I, will, I was talking more general from, from like selecting all the possible oh, selecting drugs, well, uh, then oh, going on until the end of all the clinical trials. Mm. I, I mean, I, I read that there is a, a lot, uh, almost every drug, yeah. that uh, almost every hit, uh, at the end it just uh, somehow a the, failure. Th these are the numbers. To find a binder, like uh, let's say close to micromolar binder, all you need is to test, well, in our practice, and I can show you one paper after another, you need to try, you need to experimentally test maybe 20 or 10. Okay. And one fifth of them, at least, you will find bound appreciable affinity. And this is even for completely new new pockets. Okay. It's not, not, not large numbers. If you do careful modeling and careful docking, it's really a high likelihood. Okay. And and 10 is not 100,000, so. Uh, but you know, we, we, may, we may dog a billion, but select 30, and then out of this 30, you know, five will, will work well, maybe all 30, so depends on the situation. Yeah. More questions? Hello. I wanted to ask uh, what is, uh, in your opinion, the role of the solvent in the interaction of the ligand, and uh, in which case it's advisable to use molecular dynamics to validate the binding mode hypothesis? Well, that, that's, that's uh, um, uh, of course, it plays a role. There's a, it's undeniable. It's part of the system. Um, they're good. The, uh, the implicit solvent models mimic it to some degree and make it unnecessary. Well, uh, typically, in our practice, we use the uh, the firmly bound molecules, we keep them, or we try with and without. Um, when you optimize the ligand, uh, it may contribute to your binding energy evaluation, binding score. But this is a refinement. This is not the bread and butter. If you, uh, um, depending on the situation, it may be more beneficial just to, to generate uh, some variations and test them instead of, uh, you know, um, doing, trying to make a prediction. Because the predictions are still uh, relatively, uh, I mean, they have limits in terms of accuracy. So, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, it's a vague answer, but uh, typically, uh, first rule of thumb, do the simplest and, and test experimentally. Uh, uh, and then to, to optimize, it depends on, the, on your appetite. Like if you, if you say, I don't want to synthesize more than 10 variations, that's fine. But the, in, in the pharma industry, uh, the average number of uh, uh, synthesized molecules in a drug optimization would be anywhere from 500 to 5,000, right? Um, so, but if you want to dramatically reduce that, you may go into this, uh, this effort. All right, so maybe uh, let me flip through some other things. All right, so the, the next question is about homology models. Not every time we have the, the crystal structure what we want, in particular when we target some rare parasite, um, and we need to build models by homology to find candidates. So we, have, we may have an experimental system, but no crystal structure. So we'd like to have something, you know, as as perfect as uh, as Mona Lisa. But um, when you build the model by homology, and this is let's say high resolution crystal structure, but uh, in um, when you build the model by homology, it looks more like this, right? So that's uh, you know uh, certain parts are sketchy. Um, you may pretend that it's the same. And when you look at the atomic structure, it, it, it will look almost like this, but it's really that. And um, so then there are, there are tricks basically to deal with that um, and, and improve it, but, but you can, you, you can uh, as long as you don't exploit the parts which are like the hands apparently are way off, right? So some parts are gonna be <laughs> very different. And uh, that's a trick. So this is from the paper we just published like a few days ago, I think, maybe uh, three days ago. Or maybe it's not. Um, 
maybe it will be published tomorrow, I don't know. I don't remember. But basically, here's an example of what uh, you can do. So we built a mold by homology for this uh, enzyme in Negleria foleri. And what is Negleria foleri? Uh, when you, in the United States, I think in Europe you also have that, uh, and you go to a freshwater lake, like here, uh, uh, Lago Lugano, and you dive, uh, and then through your nose, Negleria foleri, the little, little parasite which is drawn here. This is my drawing, by the way, because they insisted that we don't use any um, Wikipedia <laughs> images. So it goes through your nose uh, into the brain. On the fifth day, you have a headache. On the sixth day, you're dead, basically. And it kills 97% uh, of the patients. Uh, very nasty uh, parasite. And we wanted to find a drug which actually cures that because now there is nothing. So they, they give them a cocktail of things and it doesn't help. So we took uh, this uh, protein called uh, ERG2, it's an enzyme. Uh, and we took uh, a, a completely different protein, homo well, it's not a, a homolog of that enzyme, it's a, it's a receptor called sigma-1 receptor. And we built a model by homology we took the uh, uh, molecules, which we had a collection of them, uh, but we docked them first, and we selected just a few of them, and we identified four, um, uh, four candidates, which actually kill the, um, uh, the ame amoeba, this uh, called, in the newspapers, you'll find it as brain-eating amoeba. And that's also the answer to your question. So how many we, we test? Only 30. And we find uh, four. Uh, at, at significant binding affinity, and, and we screen, in this case, we only screen the, one, the chemicals which we had in our collection. All right, so this is another example, um, and this is uh, to show that you can extend, then the pharmacology is never complete when you look at the uh, Campbell data. So here, we were uh, interested in uh, finding the cure for medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma is the very, uh, it's a deadly childhood cancer, um, and there is one subtype of that, which is called SHH, uh, which stands for, who knows what SHH stands for? If you like video games. Sonic Hedgehog, uh, SHH. Well, uh, the name, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a 7TM protein. It kind of looks like a GPCR, but it's not a GPCR. It's a, it's a receptor. Uh, um, uh, well, uh, the smoothant uh, is a receptor of the sonic hedgehog, and that's a kind of a factor which, uh, which activates that uh, signaling pathway. So basically, there is a large subtype where it's, uh, it's overexpressed, and we were curious to find a drug which uh, helps against that, because when uh, people targeted only a smoothant receptor, which is responsible for this subtype, um, and uh, so the reason this ugly thing is here is that um, when sheep uh, graze on uh, corn lilies, so that's a particular plant, there is a, this compound in this corn lily called cyclopamine, and cyclop is what you see here. So basically, if you take cyclopamine, they grow, this uh, sheep uh, grow with one eye, they become cy cyclops. And turns out that the smoothened, it's a, and the smoothened pathway, which is here, uh, is, is responsible for this uh, phenotype. So people develop for as anti-cancer drug uh, derivatives of cyclopamine as well as other um, um, uh, hedgehog pathway inhibitors, but they didn't work well. So then we had the idea that why don't we combine the existing good pathways for cancer with additional activity against smoothened? And uh, so this, this was just published. Um, so we were interested uh, to find the drugs which already hit many important pathways for cancer, but then in addition, they also hit smoothened. And this, one's, this one it does not hit uh, smoothened. Um, and uh, we screened uh, the library of uh, already existing um, um, drugs, and we found some candidates. And now we published this paper in September 20th, which just a few days ago, nilotinib inhibits smooth and signaling in hedgehog-dependent medulloblastoma. Uh, the pocket, uh, so this is a different receptor. This is a 7TM receptor. And the uh, uh, nilotinib is the one which hits primarily ABLE1, at least initially. It was developed as a replacement for imatinib, which is Gleevec. 
Um, and but for some reason, uh, the pocket is the pocket is also it, it it's kind of elongated, but it's different in shape. But because the uh, nilotinib is a flexible molecule, it can rearrange and bind to that tightly. And we've uh, done the experiments, including the, the xenografts and mice and even the brain, and then showed that nilotinib, in addition to what was known before, also hits a smoothened receptor. Again, through docking and experiments. So, um, so now this is the, uh, the real uh, pharmacology of nilotinib before we, we uh, found the new target. And you can see how many things it hits. If you take the uh, expression into account in the spirit of, of Rita's question, so, the, uh, so that will be a small number because you know, some of them are, even though they are targets, but they are not strongly expressed in, um, in neurons, for example. Uh, uh, but then what we found is, is this new target smoothened. Now if the, uh, if the patient has the smoothened overexpressed or any part of the hedgehog pathway, you can try this drug because it will hit not only this, but also this. So, um, all right, um, now um, one more um, um, angle. So you, n not always you have the luxury of, uh, of your target being crystallized or in multiple conformations. Sometimes you know nothing uh, about your target, but you have a large number of actives. What can you do in this case? It's called the ligand-driven uh, search. So you only have a bunch of ligands. They may look different, but they all have so some activity, and some others don't have the activity. So in this case, uh, you can use the ligand-based approach, and it can still be structural. So what can you do? You can try to superimpose your, your flexible ligands into one cloud, so when, 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 uh, the, as if they, they dock to some place, but you don't know this, the place they dock. And you can use this target shape um, as a target, and you can dock to this shape. It's unusual because you're not docking to a pocket, you're using to, to some shapes of representation, and here is the, uh, the representation of how it happens. Uh, in ICM, so basically, you have, we started from multiple active uh, molecules, and we say superimpose all of them. They're completely different. And they, you see they, uh, they start forming some features, and we see at the end what's common to that cloud. So the cloud, so there's some hydrogen-morning donors, acceptors, some hydrophobic surface, and this and that, and the shape. And now you can take the target and say, well, let me generate the fields from that, and I will start docking new molecules to that shape to find some new candidates. This is totally ligand driven, so this is not receptor driven. So uh, this was evaluated by um, independent people, uh, Giganti et al, um, uh, and we uh, came up with the best method for both for chemical superposition and also for virtual screening enrichment using this, this shape. Right, okay, so the, um, today uh, we were gonna do um, we will not do much about cheminformatics, but actually cheminformatics is a big part of, uh, of this practice. And uh, some of you, are, I understand, are chemists, and you, know, you probably know some cheminformatics. Uh, but this is about, about ability to, de uh, to deal with uh, huge databases, search by substructure, by properties, um, uh, and, and ability to predict the properties of these compounds. So, um, Chemical, so we'll do chemical searching. So the uh, big part of uh, cheminformatics is knowing this language, strange language, which uh, uh, Steve Weininger calls smiles. Um, uh, and uh, so how many of you know smiles? How many of you don't know smiles? Right, so smiles, what is smiles? Smiles is the language how to, instead of drawing the picture, how to represent it as, a, as a, a string of text. And it came from a simple idea in, in math where if you have a, if you have a network, uh, if you have a diagram, you can, uh, every time you branch, you can put parentheses and, uh, and record there. And then every time you, you need to form a, a ring, you would put some label on these two places, let's say one and one. And for example, if you, if you say C1, C, 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 C1, it will be a ring of six carbons, right? 
And you can start looking uh, at any structure and recording that as a, as a text like this. And it's convenient because in com computers are not really, it's much easier in the computer to have a representation like that. Now there is smiles, so there is also a modification of smiles called smarts. Well, in, in, you can see that you can, uh, uh, there are different symbols for bonds, uh, for atoms, uh, and you can also kind of record the stereo, uh, uh, cis, trans, and, and chirality, you can record in this uh, language. And there's also the variation of that called smarts. And the smarts is, uh, smarts to smiles is the same as regular expressions to text. Those of you who are not computer scientists are probably confused. <laughs> so uh, in, in text search, there is a notion of regular expression. When you say, in the first position, is it A or B or C or D uh, uh, or any number, right? So that's, uh, that's called a regular expression. Uh, and in chemistry, uh, the smart uh, is the ability to say, well, in this position, I don't care if it's carbon or nitrogen or oxygen, you write this expression and put it inside the smiles, and, and you can have things like that. So basically, it's ability to record a chemical structure, but not exactly for, for a specific molecule, but for a class of molecules. So smiles and smarts, uh, I suggest that you study them. Another thing which uh, we would, um, in cheminformatics, is essential, is understanding the fingerprints and the so-called tenimoda similarity. Uh, uh, and this is basically uh, and a computer-friendly way to evaluate uh, similarity, or, or one minus similarity would be the distance. And all it does, it just uh, enumerates different fragments and then counts uh, and, and records them as a fingerprint. And then if you have two fingerprints, they have the same length, and you can just count how many ones in common and divide it by the total number of ones, and then, so that will be similarity. And one minus similarity will be the distance. And once you have that distance uh, and you, you know which kind of fingerprints you used, you can use it to cluster things and, um, and form clusters like this. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, a useful, that's a useful tool. We can, uh, if we have time today, we'll practice doing some of that. There are some subtleties about uh, clustering. Uh, there are these unreadable abbreviations for the types of trees. UPGMA and then uh, WPGMA. And this is just, um, it has to do with the clustering algorithm. But I don't think we have time to, to go through that, right? Uh, Vittorio, what do you think? We'll skip on the clustering algorithms. Right, so, so let's um, just go to the, uh, Last part, so the, uh, what we'll, today we'll, we'll spend some time actually doing exactly that because it's an easy environment. And this is a 3D uh, ligand editor. So, so instead of uh, configuring the docking, you can just load what you need and start from some chemical and then optimize it right there in the pocket. Um, it was developed uh, together with, with Novartis uh, computer scientists. Um, and now it tells me that Microsoft Office, you'd, uh, so it tells me some Microsoft ideas, and it actually crashed. Um, I don't know why, but um, I think that's the way God tells me to shut up, right? Uh, that's how I interpret that. Uh, yeah, I can, let me see. I was about to show this. Um, right, so this is what we, we're gonna do. So it's basically, you look at the pocket and you, you can optimize, you can try different, uh, and the software does it, uh, you know, instantly. So you can say, well, introduce those groups in these different positions, uh, and then uh, you can also manually engineer uh, the ligand 
grow in different directions and, and it will give you the ranked list of, of preferred con uh, configurations. That's what we'll do today. You can control your uh, chemical structure either from 2D, then it will be instantly, uh, you know, also um, optimized in, in 3D. Uh, and I'll skip the, the ligands. And this is just more complex systems which we can do. And, and I, since I, I didn't talk about CPCRs today, I'm sorry, there was no time. Um, so uh, that's the last slide, which says, whatever you do any calculations, always test them experimentally. Be brave, like this man, right? So what I never understood why the first one wears a jacket as well. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that, <laughs> the, the, the other one also has a gun, but like behind his back probably, right? But always test your predictions, never stop at your predictions. And thank you, and so these are the great people who worked in different parts of that. Uh, Max Sautroff is, is my very long uh, uh, time uh, collaborator and uh, uh, partner in crime. Um, so, but but the, all these people contributed a lot. Um, and thank you for your attention and see you later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have five minutes for questions and we would like to receive question from the students, so please don't be shy, and if you have questions, curiosity, <laughs> please ask. I'm standing, here's my jacket. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so uh, it's just a curiosity, basically. In uh, when you study pockets and uh, solvent exclusion surfaces, what do you use to build a surface, and how do you build it? You mean geometrically, like, like for yeah. visualization? Yeah, yeah, basically how you build the surface of the molecule, the solvent exclusion surface. It's like a software you use. I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. So. Right. All this software is is uh, uh, is called I, so every the software which we use uh, is ICM, and that's the one which I long time ago I started developing. Now there is a team at Malso who keeps. Uh, so we um, with with sort of we published a paper on. Um, and it does this, you know, surface, the 3D, the simulation, the docking, the chem informatics. It's all within one software, uh, in, uh, ICM. So the, the surface uh, we like to look at is, they're different surfaces. Like for, for ligand uh, design, you use the surface, which is uh, one, Van der Waal already is separated from the molecular surface. The molecular surface is what you, we, we call it sometimes skin, because it looks, you know, uh, like skin, but if you move one uh, radius uh, inside, that will be the surface where you like to place the center of the atom. And for ligand, for ligand uh, uh, design, people use this sort of surface. They color it by what kind of property you want in this place. So, so we, uh, we look at the, the skin-like molecular surface. We look at the Van der Waal separated surface, um, and it all can be built. And actually, if you color that molecular surface uh, in a certain way using the so-called occlusion shading, so it will be very clear where to bind your molecule because it will emphasize all the uh, uh, invaginations and, and, and more buried uh, surfaces. But we'll, we, we, we may play with that today. More questions? Come on. First of all, thank you for your nice presentation, but um, I would like to stimulate you on an issue that mm -hmm. I think is extremely important in this topic. Many authors claim that, and wrote also, that docking has reached a plateau in terms of evolution due to conformational sampling issues and the limitation of the scoring function. Mm -hmm. We may agree, we may not. Uh, I also am a fan of docking. We use docking also as a starting tool, even though we do molecular dynamic simulations and other stuff. My question is, you know that recently, uh, increasing attention is paid to kinetics of ligand instead of thermodynamics. 
like the, right, re right. the review of Copland on issue drug, uh, drug right. discovery re review. Um, my question is, what is your opinion about that? And particularly, if you are thinking to implement any kind of sampling of kinetics or binding in your docking program? Thank you. Right, so this is a good question, a very relevant one in certain classes of uh, drugs, in particular GPCR ones, which you're also interested in. There, um, for them, the, it's critical. So kinetics, ability to predict kinetics is much more difficult than ability to predict thermodynamics, right? Um, kinetics can be broken into on and off ray. So one divided by the other will give you the KD. Uh, so the, uh, the off rate, um, off rate is somewhat uh, easier to predict because at least the starting point is well defined. And uh, essentially if you block, if your GPCR closes down on, uh, uh, on, on your ligand, so then the off rate is gonna be slow. If you have a covalent uh, one. So in some, in some cases it's kind of obvious, but ability to, to optimize the subtleties of that are definitely challenging because, uh, and the main reason why it's challenging is that it involves large scale rearrangements. You know, the, the protein structures are amazingly flexible. Uh, the, one of the um, experiments which uh, I think Brian Matthews uh, was uh, talking about, so then if you, if you take a, a benzene ring, for example, and uh, it may somehow uh, get through the protein inside, get stuck there, so if you want to now predict how it happens, it breathing of this molecule sometimes big changes, and uh, this is difficult to predict, so with MD or any other method. So short answer, certain kinetic properties can be predicted because especially the off rates, um, uh, and um, it, it's difficult to do. Um, uh, others are, remain to be challenges. Yeah. No more questions? Lunch. So um, at, after the last practical session, we have the apero at the, it's a place that's really close to the university and the name is Oops. The spelling is O-O-P-S. It's 100 me meter far from the university at 6.30. Oops. <laughs>